Welcome to the Bourbon Life Podcast, your source for all things bourbon. Join your hosts, Mark and Matt, as they drink and review bourbons, share news about upcoming events, interview the who's who in the bourbon world, and most importantly, bring you along for the fun of living the bourbon life. Now, here's your hosts, Mark and Matt. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with me, as always, yes, back live in the Bourbon Life studios, my good friend, my bourbon drinking buddy, Matt. Matt, welcome. Hey, thanks, Mark. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for welcoming to, me to my show. How are you doing today, man? <laughs> good. I'm doing great. <laughs> great to be back here in the Bourbon Life studios. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, always, see, you'd been gone for a while, a couple of weeks ago, man. So it's like, you know, I, still getting used me to about it, welcoming it, you back. <laughs> I'm still getting used to being back. <laughs> yeah, you got your beanie on, man. You got everything rolling, right? Cold so, weather here. Yeah, but hey, we are actually live tonight, so we're not... We're not doing the squad cast thing. We are mm-hmm. actually live in the Bourbon Life Studios, otherwise known as my basement. So uh, it's going to be right. going to be a great show tonight. And so. you just reminded me, we're this is season three. Yeah, man. I this, completely. We're season three. Yeah, yeah, we're season three, episode one oh five. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Ugh. Yeah, man. We're, we're moving we're, on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're doing something. All right, <laughs> doing something. Somebody out there, mom and dad, thank you guys for listening. That's right. My parents have <laughs> suffered through 104 of these episodes. What's 105 anyway? Uh, my so. parents my parents don't listen, man. They're in Eastern Kentucky. <laughs> They're Southern Baptists. They don't believe in drinking, so no. <laughs> Unfortunately. Matt, you want to tell everybody who we have with us before we get derailed here, man? Absolutely. Let's get right down to it. We've got the owner of James E. Pepper Distilling here in Lexington, Kentucky. Nice to have someone from Lexington. Yeah, man. Back on this is show. great. Right. It really is, but... Amir Pei. Amir, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here with you, gentlemen. Thanks. Great to be here with you live and yeah. in person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were just talking about that off, uh, not off camera, off mic, <laughs> about, you know, actually being together with people and doing things. It's like a whole new world, right? <laughs> it feels a little surreal. It like, does. I'm it? just so used to doing Zooms and, and online things that, that, you know, I really missed it. And it's great to be back and to be in such a cool studio with such a great whiskey collection to be on some cool <laughs> podcast. So I'm excited. I feel a little, a little weird, like, you know, a fish out of water because I haven't been around people in such close quarters in so long, but it's great. I miss it. You yeah. Know, this is what I love about the whiskey industry. Uh, and before the pandemic, I spent a lot of time traveling across the country, across the world, really yeah. talking with people, drinking with people, uh, enjoying it. So uh, it's great to be back. Awesome, man. And that's what whiskey is about. You know, I mean, to me anyway, it's about hanging out with people, making new friends, uh, hanging out with old friends and, you know, getting a drink and share stories and have a good time. Right. Totally. Yeah. And it's hard to do that over a computer. I mean, granted, we talked about that, you know, it opened up some opportunities for us for the show because we were able to get people on the show that we probably otherwise would not necessarily have the chance to do um, to get them on here, but which worked to our advantage. But at the same time, man, it's just it's just so much better to just hang out, you know. I agree. I agree Absolutely. with myself. And drink. <laughs> right. And drink. And well, speaking, speaking of which, of, good job, Matt. Uh, yeah. Uh, segue, yeah. yeah. Um, Amir, I haven't lost my touch yet. You're doing good, man. La- the last show, you're like on with the jokes and now you're on track with keeping me on track, man. This is great. I miss you, Matt. When you're not here, I'm just a big, I'm a train wreck, man. I just really, the last show, that show I did down in Tennessee, man, I was like a fish, fish out of water um, at a distillery by myself, standing up the whole time, just just totally off my game. And what I'm do just I like, do with my hands? And, 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 well, and it's the first time I drank in a month, right? Because I did yeah. dry January. So I was just like, I don't know what to do. I'm drinking. I'm standing. I'm like podcasting. I don't have Matt. It's like, I'm really confused here. <laughs> so Amir, what do we got poured up, man? You brought us some good stuff here. So what do we got? Well, I did. This is, uh, this is an exciting year for us, 2022, because it marks four years of production at the historic distillery in Lexington. So we have bourbons, rise, other whiskeys turning four years old. Uh, and I brought a sample, a barrel sample from a special barrel. It is barrel number one. Nice, man. Filled, yeah, in December awesome. 2017. Mm-hmm. Very nice. That's, that's great, man. Thanks for bringing that. We really appreciate that. So, And this is actually distilled from your from the distillery, right? In oh, downtown? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, this is the first barrel yeah. that we filled. Number one. That's number awesome. One. Now is, well, you could make an argument it had a much bigger number. 
but the plant shut down in 1967. <laughs> and then yeah. 50 years later, yeah. we fired it up. There you go. But yeah. we, we couldn't, I've done a lot of historical research. I couldn't find the last barrel number. With the, yeah. You know, I was wondering, so, yeah. But we did start up using the exact same mash bill as when the plant shut down in 1967. All right. That's very so cool. we had yeah. that, that continuity in the gap, but we restarted the numbering system. So this is... So this is barrel number one. Barrel number, barrel number one. one. Hey, That's if right. you don't know where to start, go back to the beginning, right? There you go, man. There you go. So let me ask you this, because you brought a hat. You got a hat on. You brought some hats for us, which is cool, because obviously I'm a hat guy. Uh, Old Pepper Distillery. But on the website, it's the James E. Pepper Distilling Company. So... Um, so the company is the company, James E. Pepper Distilling, and the distillery is referred to as Old Pepper Distillery. Is that accurate or is it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, I, you know, I just want to no, make sure a, I got it's it. It's a great question. And <laughs> it's one that, that is somebody who's also very involved in sales and marketing for the brand and how we communicate clearly to consumers. Sure. You know, having everything under one name and one clear message is important. But one problem we have, and it's a good problem, is that there is so much amazing history with this brand and right. so many great stories with it, as well as with the the reconstruction of the distillery, that we, we want to share and communicate it all. Okay. And it, it's, it was important to us to kind of communicate with James E. Pepper 1776, the initial label that it was relaunched mm-hmm. under, um, the, the history of the brand dating back to the American Revolution, and as we start to roll out whiskeys distilled in Lexington and other products, we really also want to promote the project to renovate and rebuild this, this National Historic Landmark, sure. GSP Kentucky Number, number five. 5. We feel right? like yeah. that is a phenomenal story. So there's the man himself, James E. Pepper, who has a remarkable story, and we want to honor it, and that was his distillery. Mm-hmm. But, you know, around Lexington, people just called Pepper Distillery. Right, yeah. And there was other people associated, like his wife, Ella Offit Pepper, who had a phenomenal story. And then there's a the story of the people who are there today, you know? And so there's a story that is, is, is in a lot of ways bigger and separate than just the man himself, James E. Pepper, who we love and want to honor and respect. Right. And we just said, let's really honor this story about the old Pepper distillery. And on the label, we have a a great illustration of the actual Uh, building itself. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. If you drive down Manchester, you're going to see. Yeah. Um, And so that was kind of what we're trying to do. So I think through different labels, we try to tell different stories. Um, but yeah, the, the website is jamesypepper.com. Right. Right. And this is the old pepper label. Um, and it's got James E. Pepper on it in some smaller font as well. <laughs> and we have multiple hats and T-shirts, so it can get a little confusing. But that's okay. that's why yeah. I just I was just wanted to make sure because I I hate to I hate to do a show and be like you know calling it, oh it's the old Pepper Distillery or to you know when you're like well no we really prefer to be called the James E. Pepper Distillery. So you, I just you can call us whatever you want. <laughs> and this is and it's oh, not yeah. a weird one because this is something that I wrestle in my own head about sometimes late at night. Yeah. Like Amir, why do you so confusing? <laughs> why do you do this to people? But I'm like yeah, but you got to do this. You got to yeah. Do that. Yeah, I mean you want to include it all that makes right. sense and we'll get into that story sure uh, here in just a little bit because it's a great it is a great story and uh, you're located here in, in downtown lexington we're in lexington uh we're, we're in the in the burbs of uh of lexington over in hamburg uh but you guys are downtown man on manchester street right yes, in sir. the the pepper distilling district <laughs> yes sir we are right there on manchester yeah which is which is really cool so if you're in lexington um you, most people know where that is obviously there's so much cool stuff going on down there now um, with not just you guys, but you know, there's there's uh, Goodfellas Pizza and there's um, Tao and her group, the ice cream place down Crank there. Crank and Boom. Crank and Boom. Yep. Yeah, she's a great person as well. Love her. She is. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really cool place. So if you're coming to Lexington, it's definitely you've got. You know, that's the place to go. Yeah, we really we is. are right downtown Lexington, so we're like yeah. right by Rupp Arena. We are mm-hmm. in downtown basically, and yeah. the the whole area uh, along Manchester used to have a, an old distillery called Old Tar at the other end, and mm-hmm. it was our pepper distillery. So the whole area is called the Distillery District. Right. Um, the historic Jamesy Pepper Distillery itself is a twenty five acre property with multiple buildings. We rebuilt the distillery in the historic, the actual distilling building itself. So we're running the stills where the old stills were. Okay. But other people have built other businesses in other old buildings in the area and other buildings um, such as Crank and Boom and Goodfellas and, and, right. and many, many others. And it's a really cool area. A lot of, if not all, independent local entrepreneurs very cool, very popular, and it's mm-hmm. a great group for us to be a part of. So we're really proud yeah. of that, and yeah. we formed a you know 
a nonprofit together to promote the area, to preserve the area. Great. We think it's great for obviously all of us, but for the whole city of Lexington. Yeah. And you're right there on the creek too, which is really cool. Yep. Um, the middle, what is it? Middle Fork? Uh, Town Branch. Town Branch. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that. Yeah. It's called Old Elkhorn too, or Town Branch. But yeah. 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 The Town Branch, uh, which is really cool. All right. So let's talk about this, about the bourbon. So uh, this is barrel number one. This is a little over four years old now. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the proof? Is this straight out of the barrel? Straight out of the barrel. Awesome. Just went into the barrel at 107 proof. Okay. So this is um, very typical Kentucky kind of mash bill. It's 80% corn, 12% malted barley, 8% rye. This what, is what they're running when they shut down. Wow. Okay. So 80, that's kind of unique. Yeah. And the higher barley than rye. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, now, the mash bill actually changed. We have documentation for mash bills that go back to what the peppers were making at what is today Woodford when it was the Oscar Pepper Distillery. Okay. Mm-hmm. We have documentation of what James E. Pepper was doing and, and what Shenley was doing there from the 40s through the 60s. And it all kind of, you know, it was, you were basically in a, in a little ballpark, but, you know, they'd fit, fudge around with the numbers, a couple percent on the rye versus the right. corn here, there. Mm-hmm. We didn't get the feeling people were like, no, this is it. You know, you kind of, so, you know, but when it shut down in 67, it was 80, 12, 8. Okay. Um, but, you know, it could have been 78 corn years before that. Right. What was 70 right. other times. Yeah. So, Matt, what do you pick up, man, in terms of the nose on this one? It's got a really sweet nose of corn. I pick up, uh, like, to me, it's, it's really reminiscent of, like, Thanksgiving sweet corn casserole. Nice. So, like, nice hot buttered cornbread. Yeah. Coming with it. Uh, and then there's, like, a nice roast. I think that you're talking about the 12% barley in it. It's like a nice toasty roasted. Roasted. Kind of flavor, like a toffee yeah. type uh, aroma in it as well. And it's just got like a really nice sweetness, it's just a really, really inviting, great nose on it. Yeah, definitely. And so this this went in at 107. Is that what you said? Went into the barrel at 107. Okay. Uh, I don't, can't see what the sample doesn't have. Nobody. <laughs> I haven't tried this for a while. And one of the fellows at the distillery pulled the sample and they didn't write the proof on it. But I'm assuming it's it's around 107. I got you. Um, and um, really great oak, Kentucky oak. Air season, 24 months. Wow, okay. Number four char. Okay. Um, and yeah, I think, that, you know, your description was pretty was pretty on point. For me, I'm getting a lot of the same notes. I haven't tried this in a while, but it's just classic Kentucky corn whiskey. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, 80% corn, off the still, that classifies legally as a corn whiskey, if you wanted to call it that. Right. Um, mm-hmm. that, 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 that percentage of corn in there. And you just get all those lovely corn notes, that sweet bread, that sweet. sweet notes, the cornbread, yep. you know, Vanilla oak, really just a, a really nice sipping whiskey. To me, this is drinking real nice, real easy. See, I haven't sipped it yet. I've just been nosing it. But now I, I do notice as I swirl it in a glass, it's got a great color, um, but also it's clinging. So these, is it unfiltered? Oh, yeah. It's so, right, right out of the barrel. Right, yeah. So it, yeah, you said it. But now will your stuff be unfiltered when you when you guys? Oh, yeah. The, we, we're, we're huge fans. We Our favorite way to drink whiskey is right out of the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> you and I both, right? And, you know, when you start doing that in your life and yeah. then you try and drink anything else, <laughs> it's like, no. really hard. No, it doesn't yeah. work. No, yeah. Not going to do and, that. Yeah. And so even, you know, we, we should, most people, a lot of the people in the industry, when they're really doing samplings, you'll see them dilute it oftentimes down to like 30%, you know, 40% alcohol. Yeah. Because um, you supposedly can pick up more impurities, but we're just like... We don't like doing that. We just really <laughs> like to, t- to taste, you know, critically our whiskeys, cast strength, uh, and just enjoy it. Um, and and everything pretty much for us, uh, you know, our flagship whiskeys, is 1776 Rye and Bourbon, right. uh, which are our best-selling whiskeys, win tons of awards. Um, we put very proudly on the label, unfiltered. You know, nice. we, we want to give, oh, yeah. uh, even if we add a little yeah. bit of water to proof it down, yep. um, we still want to maintain as much barrel character as possible. Gotcha. Uh, and that's just a goal for us. Yeah, very nice. So, Amir, before we get like too far down the road um, on the story of the of the distillery, let's talk about you. Can you tell our listeners about yourself? I mean, where are you from? Um, how you got into the bourbon whiskey industry? What what led you to this path? Well, uh, what led you down this road? Sure. <laughs> I, I, what is it? The Grateful Dead song to say, what a long, strange <laughs> what a, trip it's yeah, been. Yeah, there you go. That's right. right. Uh, yeah. It wasn't by any really well thought out, smart design. Um <laughs> I'm not somebody who went to, you know, I don't have an MBA. I did not come from private equity or anything. Uh, I studied philosophy <laughs> in college. Well, you can go back for where am I from. I was born in Northern California, 
I grew up in New Mexico and Washington, D.C. I actually okay. have some very old family roots in Kentucky. Um, the Pay, if you ever heard of Austin Pay University. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, connected to my family. Um, no really direct connection, but. Right. But Pays, you know. Gotcha. Um, so there's old Pays and, you know, Butler County. We have a family cemetery from the 1800s and, you know, Louisville way back in the early 1800s. So way back. But that family then went on to the Ozarks and then gotcha. they and moved out to the. To California, my grandfather was a great farmer, but um, but so that was kind of the path I took. And when I was a young guy, I worked in you know went, went to college in Santa Barbara, California, UCSB. Oh yeah, um, so boy, I, but that was rough, wasn't it? Having to go to college in, <laughs> in Santa Barbara, gosh, how awful every day. Are those is that the banana slugs? Uh, no, or I is think, that Santa Cruz? No, we're the gauchos. Okay. The gauchos. We're gauchos. Nice. Yeah. Um, a beautiful place and, yeah. uh, surprised <laughs> I graduated. No doubt, man. Uh, I would have, yeah, I can't imagine like going to school somewhere in Florida on the coast or going to California somewhere. I'd be like, nope. That's why I be- studied philosophy. <laughs> if you just want to sit around and drink and bullshit. Uh, oh, sorry. Can I say bullshit? Yeah. Okay. yeah right, you right, can right, say whatever right, you want to say, man. Yeah. We're, so, we're, we're not dr- family friendly. <laughs> first sip of whiskey and it took me two minutes to curse. So that's all right. <laughs> man. That's all right. All right. So <laughs> study philosophy. Um, which I really enjoyed. And um, when I was done, you know, I was dead broke living out there and wanted to stay. But this is where, you know, millionaires and billionaires live. It's right. either you're a broke college kid or you're insanely wealthy. Um, and uh, I was the, the former, not the latter. <laughs> but there was this great wine country and restaurant scene out there. And I worked a lot of jobs in restaurants and bars as a young kid. My father was in, in the restaurant business. Um, I started working in restaurants when I was 15. Um, and so I just kind of knew that space. And, and I I saw these wineries and, and restaurants, and I said, God, this would be fun to, to publish a little magazine covering it. So I started to publish a little rinky-dink magazine called Wine and Dine Santa Barbara. Nice. Now, to call it a magazine is it, a little <laughs> too much. It was on newspaper print. It came out four times a year. Yeah. Um, but you could sell advertising. I, I could try. <laughs> so I used to, what I would do is pick up the phone. I was the publisher, the editor, the sole employee. <laughs> and I would pick mm-hmm. up the phone and cold call restaurants and wineries to try and sell them advertising. There you go. Yeah. Talk about, if you want to get good at sales, that's a good way to do it. And half of them, you know, would pay me cash, which would barely keep me alive and paying rent. Right. And the other half would say, can I pay you in trade? So here I am, you know, 25, uh, you know, I'm the quote unquote publisher of Wine and Dine Santa Barbara. <laughs> um, dead broke. My wife and I live in like college kids, but I had unlimited trade at the finest five star <laughs> restaurant on the Central Coast. Mm-hmm. I nice. had so much wine from the best wineries. I had to run a wine locker. Um, and I'm just sitting here, you know, and, and to be quite candid, when I started, I didn't know a single thing about wine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so not just to learn along the way, man. Yeah, you I know, know one way to find out. That's then. right, not, man. Start a business and just l- learn. You know? you know, not too long before I started publishing that, I was probably drinking Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> and then a couple Boone's years Farm, later, yeah, uh, see, yeah, you know, Thunderbird, <laughs> yeah, you know, man. yeah. And then two years later, I'm I'm the publisher of a wine magazine, swirling hundred dollar <laughs> Pinot Noirs in a glass, talking with a billionaire who owns a winery. Did you wear an ascot while you're doing it? No, <laughs> no. I, as you can see, I'm not a great dresser. Uh, so you know, I, I but so I quickly had to learn and pretend sure. I knew. And but but what I did is I really fell in love with wine, and and over time I developed a great appreciation for it, uh, and I developed a pretty good palate for it. Uh, and really furthered my palate for all things food and drink, you know, and that built on my restaurant experience and bar experience that right. I worked in. So I worked in a lot of bar jobs too, bar back, bartender, much better bar back than bartender. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good at manual <laughs> labor, but not so much fine, <laughs> finesse stuff. That public facing thing, you know, making the drinks. It's yeah. Kinda, yeah. Um, and it was a little different era for bartending than today. It was a little closer to the cocktail Tom Cruise era. <laughs> right, right. Mixology. Right, yeah. Um, but uh, did that. Um, kind of got a knack for, you know, branding and storytelling through that. Um, sold that little magazine for the price of a used car, uh, <laughs> a beat up old one. Moved back to Washington, D.C., working my dad and brothers in uh, construction. And when I was there, I got into whiskey uh, and I started going to some great whiskey bars over there. Yeah. Uh, Bourbon, Jack Rose, if you ever heard of mm-hmm. that, Bill Thomas. Oh, yeah. uh, great guy, great whiskey collections, yeah. great, great bars. And I got into whiskey and... I got into Irish whiskey uh, and bourbon. I'm part Irish, um, and I had this this idea, kind of a harebrained idea, to to create an Irish whiskey brand, um, and to do it named after a very famous old bare knuckle boxing champion named John L. Sullivan. Okay. Um, I used, I'm a big boxing fan. I used to be a freelance journalist for boxing when I was doing the Wine Magazine. I also wrote <laughs> really? for That's cool, man. boxing websites. Nice. I didn't get paid any money. 
but they would say, if you cover this, we'll give you a basically a ringside seat, front row, you know, Vegas to the Staples Center. Right. These huge prize fights. And yeah. it's like, are you kidding me? Deal. Yeah. Like, That's I'm a deal. There. Yeah. I'm, I'm done. You yeah. know, I'll mm-hmm. pay for my own gas. Yeah. So uh, I'm just a big boxing fan, and I'm part Irish. You wouldn't tell from my name. Uh, but, yeah, <laughs> but there I you am. go. Good right. part Irish. Love boxing. And um, John Hall Sullivan was the last great bare knuckle boxing champion of the world. Um, end of a legacy of 170 years of champions. He was the first gloved heavyweight champion of the world, beginning of the legacy champions we have up until today. Gotcha. Okay. And this was in the 1880s. Um, mm-hmm. But he was much more than that. Um, you know, he was an Irish American icon, uh, the first American athlete to earn over a million dollars. This is the 1880s. Wow. First American athlete to become a national celebrity. No such thing as a famous athlete in America before John L. Sullivan. Okay. Huh. Was a vaudeville performer. Used to spar with Teddy Roosevelt, um, <laughs> and his picture was on the saloon in pretty much every bar across the United States because um, he was kind of this icon of manliness. And nice. if you ever see those old black and white photos of a guy with a twisty handlebar mustache, yeah, putting his dukes up in a putting weird fu- way, yeah, yeah, that was John Osullivan. Okay, all right. So this was a story because you know my dad was into boxing and my family. And I, this is a story that I knew growing up, but no one knew about anymore. And I just. I love that story. I love history. I love Americana, sure. boxing, whiskey. And I just like, what a great way to pay tribute to the old champ than with a fine Irish whiskey. And I said, let me see if I can do this. And I started looking into it, making calls. And I found a partner in Ireland, the Cooley Distillery. Nice. Great distillery, won a ton of awards. This is maybe 2006, early 2007. I went over and had to harass them for, till no end because, you know, who am I? I'm somebody who has no money, have no connections, no experience, don't know anything or anything about the business. Finally got them to agree to meet with me and to work with me because the one of the founders had gone to school in Boston where John L. Sullivan was from. His nickname was the Boston Strong. Uh, he goes, I know that story. All right, Amir, we'll give you a shot. <laughs> you, know, we'll, you work with our blender. You yeah. help them create a blend. You create the label. You own it. You do all this. And I said, all right, bet. Let's do it. So put my life savings into it, brought over a 20-foot container of Irish whiskey, didn't know a single person in, in the industry, and just <laughs> said, please, God, let me find someone to buy this. Or I'm going to have a lifetime <laughs> supply of thousands well, of bottles. And whiskey. Yeah, and it was, it was really good whiskey. I was like, hey, thank God it's good whiskey, yeah, right. and, and uh, it doesn't go bad. So I was like, it couldn't mm-hmm. be bad. But actually did really well. In under a year, national distribution, working with some of the biggest distributors in the country. Wow, man. And you know, it was kind of a hit. So I'm off to the races in this, in this whiskey business, and... Not too long thereafter, um, I'm looking over some old photographs, because again, I'm a history buff, boxing fan, looking at a yeah. photograph from a fight in America, July 4th, 1910. It was Jack Johnson, first black heavyweight champion uh-huh. in the world. Right. Very, very famous American athlete. Ken Burns made an Emmy Award winning documentary about him called Unforgivable Blackness, won a bunch of Emmys. Uh, remarkable story. This fight was called The Fight of the Century. I'm looking at a photo of him versus Jim Jeffries, and I see the two boxers in the ring. This Library of Congress photo, you can see it on our website, um, and in the museum at the distillery. And in the middle of them is this banner between the two fighters. It says, James E. Pepper Whiskey, Born with the Republic. Huh. And I said, huh, i never heard of that whiskey <laughs> brand. Yeah. You see, me, it's like, get on the Google. I start Googling things. <laughs> I get on the Google. The Google. I get on, yeah, the that's Facebook. How, the that's Facebook. how t- tech savvy I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I just start finding little bits and pieces. Now, everything you'll see in our museum or here today um, or I, I recommend if people get a chance, go to our website, go to jamesypepper.com, go to the history page, go to the whole story. I work with a PBS filmmaker in Kentucky. We made a little 10-minute documentary oh, about cool. the brand and Great. the story. And I've been doing historical research for over 15 years on this brand and, and continue to this day. And everything you'll see in that little documentary in the museum, like I didn't find that on one little blog post and we just copied and pasted. Like I found bits and pieces. <laughs> yeah. But what I could just see was this is arguably the oldest whiskey brand in Kentucky, if not American history one of the founding families of American whiskey, and it had just been abandoned. No one cared. And I just said, this is a story that should be told. Yeah. This is a brand that should be alive. Like, again, I love classic American brands. I love Americana. You're right. I love stories. I love history. Love whiskey. And it was I, something you had just done, really, with O'Sullivan. I mean, you kind of took a story that was there, uh, Irish whiskey, but this was something, obviously, more right. American-based and, and we're not... Not necessarily more American based, but I mean, it was just yeah. something different, something new, but kind of the same concept, right? Have, just something. And I had these roots, family roots in Kentucky. And I was yeah, just, right. I was just really intrigued by it. So I was able to acquire the rights to the brand uh, very easily. No one cared about it. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. That's that just, I mean, yeah. You, to, it's crazy. Well, today I tell people that, but 
and people go, I can't believe it. And I go, but that was literally the easiest part of the entire journey. <laughs> okay. Nobody cared and nobody yeah. knew about the brand. Because this was back 2007, seven, before yeah. everything really went nuts. Before I went nuts. Yeah. And okay. you know, the first thing I did, because again, here I am, this bootstrapper. I have no money for anything. You know, I'm a one-man show for years, literally. Just keep putting all my money into whiskey <laughs> and then selling whatever profit I make, go back into whiskey. Um <laughs> And still, that's my business model today. So I have no <laughs> life savings. I have no 401k. <laughs> Everything's in barrels full of whiskey. But you got some O'Sullivan Irish whiskey yeah. still that you can and, sell. And thankfully, from what I'm drinking here, it's good whiskey. So, yeah, so, no doubt. You man. know, um, the, the so I I went to every big distillery in Kentucky or tried to and said, please meet with me. I need to find a partner to help relaunch this iconic whiskey brand. And I had put together a little PowerPoint that I thought was impressive. Uh, looking at it, these days, I'm like, so bad. <laughs> And I, I harassed everybody, and I managed to get a couple of sit-downs with some actually pretty important people. I won't drop names, but I got a, I, I sat down actually with one CEO of one of the largest bourbon distilleries and whiskey companies in Kentucky, and a really nice guy, and he just looked at me, he kind of looked at me and said, Amir, I don't understand, how did you get this meeting with me? Like, <laughs> I was like, listen, just hear me out. <laughs> why am I here with yeah, you, Yeah, why Amir? am I, I don't here? I really understand. I'm very persistent, um, <laughs> but very respectfully so. And really nice, and we talked, and we actually kicked around some things, but you know, everybody kind of said, Amir, you're a nice guy. We wish you the best of luck. Um, but, you know, there's a, tons of these old brands. Nobody cares. And right. we've got our own. So just good luck to you, but we're not interested. So I said, all right, well, how am I going to do this? Uh, you know, I don't have the money to build a distillery. Uh, no bank will loan it to me. Um, and so I started going actually on these online bourbon forums, trying to find people like, hey, I have this old <laughs> recipe and this old brand. We have anybody help me. And the first people who helped me actually... So I, somebody replied in one of these bourbon oh, chat really? rooms. Yeah. <laughs> Might be like straightbourbon.com or something. And yeah. it was these guys in Bowling Green who had a little craft distillery and their name was Corsair Artisan. Okay. Um, today they're very well known as one of the craft distillery darlings. They're very innovative, very early. Um, they're, they're more well known for their Nashville operation, but they had a little one in in Bowling Green, um, and they said, hey, we just started this. Yeah, we'll do it for you. We'll offer it. <laughs> sure, sure, great. On, can, when you can be, I'll be, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, you know, my, my old family cemetery in Butler County, Pay Family Cemetery, was like 20 minutes away. I was like, yeah, go check that out in the middle of the field, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, And, right. uh, you know, another reason. So I went down. We made just like a little bit of whiskey. It was like just barely any, but everybody who tried it, you know, distributors, we, everyone loved it. It, we could only make just a little bit and right. their business started to grow. And so they had to focus on their own things. And I understood we were just doing a fun, little fun collaboration really. Yeah. Um, so I need to look for a bigger partner. Um, and I found this distillery just North of the Ohio called the Lawrenceburg distillery in Indiana <laughs> today. <clears throat> I've heard, heard of that. More yeah. well known as MGP. This was yeah. before they were acquired by MGP. Yeah. And you know, well, now they're, now they're what? Squ Ross and Squibb? Ross. So yeah, Lux yeah. Row Bottom Out. Is that what it's called? Ross and Squibb or something? Yeah, like anyway. yeah, yeah. Ross and Squibb. Yeah. Ross, I, I thought it should have been the Rossville because that's the label they have. And <laughs> yeah, Rossville Union, names, right? Yeah. But right. Ross and Squibb, hey. What hey, right yeah. <laughs> cool. They make good whiskey, I'll tell you that much. W yes, so, def definitely do that. No doubt. What I loved about it is, you know, they were a different place. Their parent company was in bankruptcy at the time. I think it was owned by a company in the, in the Caribbean and they were on life support there. Yeah. So it was... Like I had to harass them to work with me pretty much. You know, like, <laughs> And what I loved when I finally got in there and meeting with everybody, really great people. Um, and by the way, like Greg Metz, you know, their ex yeah, right, still right. a good friend and mentor to me. Yeah, uh, solid uh, guy. Right? He's totally, with Old Elk, right? Old, Old Elk. Elk now. We so much on. respect for Greg and, you know, yep. Larry Ebersol who came out of there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that was his ex Seagram's distillery, you know, and anybody who knows anything about American whiskey back in those days, Seagram's days, knows that Seagram's was the pinnacle of quality in American right, whiskey. Right. Four Roses is next Seagram's plant. So right. you're talking about the same yeast strains, you know, and you'll even, you know, I've heard Jim Rutledge say on a podcast that, you know, when he was sent in to get Four Roses making high quality whiskey again, you know, he was trying to turn around, he was sending samples from Four Roses to Lawrenceburg, Indiana for them to analyze there. So the, the distillery in Indiana was actually their flagship distillery for whiskey in this right. area. Yeah, um, They have some things production-wise that a lot of distilleries don't have, namely like if they have a bad fermenter for whiskey, they have the ability to run it over and make it into GNS. Meaning if you don't like the way the fermentation is going, the chemistry is not good, yeah. you don't have to waste that grain or barrel up subpar whiskey you can just turn to vodka right tell me another distillery who has that ability to do that right so the the quality control they had in place there and the caliber of whiskey was phenomenal 
Um, and really what I loved also is they made this one rye mash bill, 95% rye, 5% malt to barley. All too well known today. At the time, <laughs> nobody, nobody knew, nobody, and no yeah. one was making whiskey like that in America. Yeah. And what I really loved is that James E. Pepper used to make a pure rye whiskey, 100% rye. Gotcha. And I said, wow, this is like that old style. This is the style that he was making it. Right. And this is phenomenal whiskey. And hey, they're willing to work with me. Like, <laughs> so, like the moon and stars aligned, yeah. you know, which has happened a few times. And I feel very lucky for when things like that happen. So we started to work together and launched um, James E. Pepper 1776 rye whiskey. Nice. Which really allowed me to build up some more volume, yeah. get the business going. I'll tell you what, hey, Amir, yep. let's stop there so we can take a break. Real, actually, let's talk about the, the what we're drinking here real quick. Mm-hmm. Talk about the tasting notes on that, and we'll come back and pick up that store before we keep going down that road um, so we can keep a nice little nice little break sure. there. But no, I love the story so far, man. It's just like, you know, I'm sitting there listening, and I'm like, we probably need to take a break. <laughs> Good. All right, Matt, tasting notes. So what do you, what do you get, man, on the bourbon? Spicier than I was expecting. Yeah, it I is. I like it. It is. It's got that nice, good, peppery start on the front of the palate. Then that the corn, caramel, vanilla, good amount of oak coming through with it too. But uh, drinks really well. Nice, nice long finish too. And good and oily in the mouth. Just really, really great drinking bourbon. Great. Yeah, it, I agree with that, man. I mean, it really is. Four years old, uh, solid, right around one hundred seven, maybe somewhere right yep. on that. Um, 80%, only 8% rye though, right? That's it. Which is kind of surprising. It's yeah, just, super hard to believe. Yeah, I know, man, because that spice, there is a spiciness to it that's like, mm-hmm. and there is a nice linger on that finish as well. Um, you know, it's not it's not flat, it's not tannic, uh, all the things that I like, you know, a nice long tingly linger on that finish um, and no tannic effect, no drying, no nothing, uh, just a sweet, you know, well-balanced, well-balanced bourbon. Very nice. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. It was a yeah. little nerve-wracking bringing you guys. This no, the, no, man. The that's first a... barrel in a distillery. <laughs> Let me tell you, you talk to anybody, you talk to Aaron, our master distiller, like when you start up your distillery the first time, everything doesn't run perfectly well. Right, right. So you're really troubleshooting for the first six months almost, if not a year, yeah. that it planned. No, so. I mean, if that's an indication of what's coming, man, that's uh, that's some solid stuff. No doubt about that. Yeah. Let's take a quick break, get a word from our sponsors, uh, and we'll be back with more with Amir Pei, the owner of Old Pepper or James E. Pepper Distilling, whatever you want to call it, the Pepper Distillery, um, in just a minute. Thanks. Located just east of Lake Tahoe and the Sierra Nevada Mountains, Frey Ranch Distillery was founded by fifth-generation Nevada farmers. Our grain-to-glass bourbon is made using a four-grain mash bill, including a non-GMO corn, rye, wheat, and barley, all of which is 100% sustainably grown on the 1,500-acre Frey Ranch. And our commitment to excellence shows with a recent gold medal win at the 2020 Whiskies of the World and USA Spirits competitions. Find out more at www.frayranch.com. The Stave Restaurant is a bourbon lover's paradise right here in the heart of bourbon country. Located at 5711 McCracken Pike in Millville, Kentucky, between Castle and Key and Woodford Reserve, Chef Kyle Klatka prepares amazing food each day that features an elevated Kentucky-inspired cuisine. With a full-service bar, great bourbon flights, and signature cocktails, the Stave is the perfect place to catch up with friends after a fun-filled day of touring the local distilleries. Be sure to check them out online at thestavekentucky.com or at Instagram and Facebook at The Stave Kentucky. All right, everybody, welcome back for another episode. <laughs> welcome back for round two of the Bourbon Life Podcast. Man, oh man, man, I'm already drinking, and look, I've had one round, and I'm already losing control here, man. Gosh, it has been a while for us, <sighs> hasn't it? Gosh, anyway, welcome back for round or session two of the Bourbon Life Podcast, whatever you want to call it. I'm your host, Mark. With me, as always, is my good friend, Matt. Matt, welcome back. <laughs> hey, thanks, Mark. Let's uh, let's just waste no time and get yeah, right back, because we let's kind get of back left into a cliffhanger here. We did, that's pay. right of the James E. Pepper or Old Pepper Distilling Company here in Lexington, Kentucky. But before we get there, what do we have poured up, Amir? We always forget to talk about it. So uh, yeah, especially before we yeah. get back to the story. Well, this is an interesting one. Um, we primarily make bourbon and then rye at the old distillery, but we really love to have fun experiment. Um, making whiskey is fun. And yeah. there's so many great grains and so many styles of whiskey. So we, we have fun. And we like to use a certain grain palette. So the historical palette primarily, but then some other interesting ones as well. Um, and one thing that we all enjoy is, is single malt whiskey. Um, so we make a little bit of single malt every year. Okay. And we've been doing a lot of experimentation. So we have older single malts, you know, single malts that are, you know, 
four, you know, three, four years old, but I've actually brought a two year old today. Okay. Um, one that just the fellas at the distillery itself, we just haven't been enjoying it. So sometimes, you know, age is just a number. Um, right. You know, bourbons tend to need a little more time to barrel, you know, mm-hmm. rise next. But distillate from 100% malted barley is, is a really interesting distillate. And it can, it can, in this climate, it can taste really good at a, at a relatively young age. Okay. Uh, we experiment with different types of cooperage. And this is a two year old single malt aged in used cooperage. Oh, okay. Cast strength. Okay. Going to be. About 110 proof, I'd say. Again, okay. we didn't write the proof on this one, but it's cast strength, and that's what it went in the barrel at. So when you say used cooperage, uh, used bourbon barrel? Ex-bourbon. Ex-bourbon. Okay. All right. Just just making sure. So, And when you say it's a single malt, just so people, most people understand that. Some people that are bourbon fans may not understand, but it, we were talking 100% malted barley on this, right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So that's, 100% malted barley. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's what this is distilled from. Matt, what do you pick up in terms of nose on this one? I pick up a lot of orange or apricot okay coming through on the nose and there's like a little bit of a like a mossy kind of earthy tone to it but a lot of just a lot of apricot it's actually got a really bright nose i was expecting like a little bit more of traditional scotchy noses but this is not that at all i it's it's nice it's bright and kind of playful would it, would it sound weird if i say this almost to me has kind of almost like a, a like a dill type of aroma to it i mean i don't don't, you know because i don't drink a lot of single malts i don't drink scotch i mean i just i just i'm a bourbon rye guy um but there's just something there i can't put my finger on it but like matt said it's a it's bright it's something that you know it's it's not your like a caramel or vanilla it's just something different that stands out that's bright to me um and it's just kind of so it may not be dill but it's just kind of reminiscent for some reason to me of that yeah I, i think you know i get grass I get a little bit of honeysuckle. Okay. I do get the bright, some citrus notes there. Mm-hmm. Um, it is a bright, playful kind of distillate and flavor profile, you know, whereas bourbon is going to be a little more rich, a little right. more rounded, a little more of that, you know, oily mouthfeel on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of that might be the new cooperage. Uh, but this is is sort of like, a, I don't know, something like you'd almost, like a palate cleanser almost. It's yeah. Like it's just bright mm-hmm. and lively. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. On the nose. I have not. Complexity. Yeah. Haven't tasted it yet, so I'll Sorry, do that. I jumped nope. ahead of you. That's all right, man. That's all right. I'll just I keep sniffing. I'm just <laughs> swirling it around. So, all right, let's go back. We're we're talking the story. Um, you had reached out to MGP um, at the time that was not MGP, but is now MGP. <laughs> but uh, you were you're a fan of the rye because it was it was reminiscent of what you had found in terms. And this is research you'd done in terms of what the mash bills were. So you had discovered what was being distilled by the pepper distillery. Correct. Um, so you found a mash bill that was extremely high rye or pure, all rye. Pure rye. Pure rye. rye. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, of course, the MGP mash bill or the whatever the plant was at the time, um, was it still Seagram's? I think it was what? called LDI. LDI. It was not Long, owned by Seagram's. That's right. Um, it was owned by, I believe, Angostura in the Caribbean. Okay, that's <clears> right. Um, so so they're doing this 95.5, um, which at that point, of course, today, every, like you said, everybody knows 95.5, yep. but... Back then, people, you know, it's kind of a whole new thing for people, right? So, uh, so you forged that relationship with them. Um, now, were, were you just were you buying the barrels from them that were already distilled, or did they actually contract to still for you what your mash bill was? So both. So I okay. began buying aged whiskey. Okay. But then very quickly, at the exact same time, began to lay down barrels with them and fill it. Mm-hmm. Um, we use that classic recipe that they were doing because it was a phenomenal recipe and it was in their production queue. And we talked right. about changing it, tweaking it. We looked at that getting close, but for, for certain technical logistical reasons, I won't get into the nuances. We decided to just stay the course because it would have been a very minor change really in terms of the overall flavor profile. And it was just working very well. And again, the team who was there, Greg Metz, everybody, I mean, it's phenomenal. Right? Yeah. Great people knew what they were doing. And that specific recipe wasn't even really created, um, you know, as something that's meant to be drank as a straight pure whiskey. It was created as a flavoring component uh, that was going to be blended into, I think it was (laughs) Seagram 7 or Crown Royal. Isn't that crazy? And Mm -hmm. it was just like, you you know, talk about a flavor, you know, taste, you know, what people want changes in the public, right? So when they created this recipe, it was a time where people were drinking light-bodied whiskeys, but they needed to punch up those kind of, you know, lighter Canadian whiskeys with a punch of flavor. So let's just create this 
big, flavorful, robust rye whiskey that's just basically 100 percent, you know, pure rye, right? And just <clears throat> use it to to blend in five or ten percent to one of these kind of very, you know, uh, I say I'm going to be respectful here of Canadian whiskey, but like, <laughs> I know. Okay. Go ahead and say what yeah, you want. There's say some phenomenal that. Canadian whiskey, by right? The way. Love the Canadian whiskeys. There's some great ones, but also some that are probably were produced at the time. Some people called them brown vodka, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah. so they were just like, we'll take this big flavor bomb and then blend it in there. And, but then when people started to try it pure, they were like, oh my god, I want that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. And and that I was in that early cohort of people who were trying the stuff that was really never meant for daylight. Um, That's and it, crazy. <clears throat> and it was it was just great. So we said let's let's bottle it up at a hundred proof, unfiltered, want all that character in it. And I was really eyeballing sort of the cocktail market and, you know, and, and on-premise bars. And uh, when we rolled it out, you know, I think at the time, really, the only other 100-proof rye whiskey out in the market was Rittenhouse. Okay. And any, any real volume. This was very early to the rye research, renaissance. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rittenhouse, so it was starting to take off, but it was always out of stock. So you had a lot of, you know, bars and restaurants who, you know, really – in some of these markets that were really into rye early, like San Francisco, New York, people who were like into it way before the country got into it more. And you'd have a bartender who had a hundred proof rye in a cocktail and then Rittenhouse is out of stock for three months. Like, what do we do? So my, my distributor was like, well, we got a solution for you. Yeah. Pepper, 1776. Nice. And people would try it and go, this is phenomenal. This flavor is great. Yeah. And the whiskey's great. And they like the story and the label. And, and so we just, it was an organic hit. It was a big hit. Mm-hmm. So really just help you know, establish this little independent whiskey company of mine. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of got the pepper brand out there and back on the map. So that was the first, uh, bottle. That was the first release you all had, right? The 1776. Well, rye, or was there the something? first technically was the one we made with Corsair. Oh, right. Okay. Right. I okay. I got, still got a few bottles. somewhere. Do you really? I'll okay. try it someday. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, but, uh, that was the first one that we were able to produce enough to get it out to, you know, a fair amount of the country. Okay. Um, so yeah. Gotcha. And that's it. And cause you brought a bottle. So this is the same, it's been a hundred proof since you rolled it out. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a blend of barrels. Um, yes. so were you all doing your own, were you doing the blending or was it on site at, at LDI or how we, was that? We were doing the blending. We started out working with a third party bottler. Okay. Um, all right. Cause at this point I'm still like a one man show doing this all <laughs> from my like two bedroom, one bathroom apartment. <laughs> Uh, so I have no money to do anything except put everything into barrels of whiskey. Yeah. Um, so I work with them, but we would send in cooperage, you know, we were involved in the production we had a production agreement, so we were getting new make, you know, and so we were involved in every step of the process. Um, and then when it came to production, you know, we were involved in that part of it too. And, um, you know, I think that's why the whiskey has had such a, a great reception. And, and, you know, I will say, obviously there's a lot of new people today work with this, that mash bill from from Lawrenceburg from MDP. Right, right. Um and you still will see surprising amount of differentiation in end products if you try them. Mm-hmm. Um you know we have had 1776 has won countless gold double gold medals at San Francisco New York World Spirits competitions. Um you know I think Fred Minnick did a blind tasting where he went out and bought every rye in the market under 40, under 45 bucks and blind tasted them. Yeah. We came in first place. Wow. That's um, awesome. And yeah, I mean, he's got a great palate and, and you know, it was all blind and we beat, honestly, we beat whistle pig in blind competitions. I've seen people do them on YouTube and we, we win. And so people, you know, how is that? Well, you know, there's different things. I mean, it's cooperage matters, you know, right. how you bottle matters, how you filter or the lack thereof matters. Mm-hmm. Um, knowing anything about where the barrels are being warehoused matters. Um, you know, having continuity in the age and the profile. I mean, when you control that pipeline going all the way back to new fill, there's a consistency to your product, right? Versus people who just come and buy spot whiskey at various ages, right. even if it's the same distillate, you know? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. But starting out with a rye, I mean, that's kind of a, I don't want to say backwards. It's just kind of different. I mean, for a whiskey brand, you know, instead of saying, hey, we're here in Kentucky, we're going to put out a bourbon. Right. Well, at the time, um, you know, again, I'm playing with my entire life savings here <laughs> and I'm trying to not go bankrupt and do things. <laughs> sure. So 
I'm looking at what's going on in the category in whiskey, and I just said, well, there's a couple things at play in my, in my decision. First of all, I don't think I had enough money to do a bourbon and a rye at the time. I gotcha. Mm -hmm. Number two, I said, you know, I have so much respect for this brand as a Kentucky bourbon brand, so much respect for it, that while I think the whiskey and the distillery and everybody in Indiana is phenomenal people, and for all intents and purposes, it's it's on literally on the opposite banks of the Ohio of Kentucky. So <laughs> right, if it was on right. the other side of the river, it'd be in Kentucky. <laughs> right, yep. But it's not. And I just said to myself, I said, you know, let me try and save the Kentucky bourbon, like bourbon to be something else down the road, because I always wanted to build a distillery in Kentucky. Yeah. But I couldn't do it. I didn't have the money, you know, it loaned it to me. So I was like, I got I to gotta do something first. And then this rye is phenomenal. And it's unique. And I, I think I could be more competitive in the space because there's a lot of bourbon out there, um, you know, from bigger producers. So I'll probably get creamed. But at the time, rye was really not, it wasn't being made in the volumes it is today by right. larger producers. So I just looked at the market and I saw an opportunity to do something that today, there's so many ryes out there and there's so many from Lawrenceburg and from craft distilleries and from big distilleries. But when I did this, there was not. It was a different right. world. Right. Um, so we were really early to to the rye space, just like we're, I was really early to Irish whiskey. You know. So w what was the release date? What year did that come out? Your 1776 rye? 76, I think it was <clears throat> 2011. Okay, so quite a while ago. Yeah. Okay, great. And then the bourbon came out how long after that? So then after 76, Rye was out. You know, I got to know everybody at Lawrenceburg pretty well. Yeah. And just from time to time, some bourbon would come available. So we started doing some very limited bourbon releases. You know, we did a, you know, 15-year-old Rye and bourbon out of Lawrenceburg. And it just, I got to know everybody there really good. And we're, we were friends. And it's like, why not? Let's put a little bourbon out. You know, Amir, I tend to overthink things sometimes. Like my brother said to me once, he said, Amir, you're so smart, you're stupid. <laughs> and like, so sometimes I overthink Like, you know, I'm like, don't do bourbon, save the bourbon oh, for yeah. Kentucky. But then, you know, there's, I'm drinking great bourbon. I'm like, well, we could do a little limited release for some bourbon under the 76 label. Yeah. So, and you know, by the way, we've always been transparent about where the whiskey where it comes from. Sure. Uh, because first of all, we, we always sold a very competitive price, right? So mm -hmm. on the 1776 line of whiskeys, We've never been out there competing with craft distilleries with some story about how we made this in our garage or something. Like, right. We compete on price with large producers, the biggest distilleries. So I'm out there fighting for cocktail programs against the biggest producers, and still to this day. So number one, we're selling a high-quality gold, double gold medal winning product at, at a competitive price point. And you pull our cola from day one. said distilled in Indiana on the back label. We talked about right. the Lawrenceburg distillery. We talked about the old style that Jamesy Pepper used to make and why this is that old style. And furthermore, the same way I used to talk about the Cooley distillery, like, you know, it's funny, I see people work with other distilleries like Cooley's back in the day and then with Lawrenceburg, and they would always hide it, they'd obfuscate it, like they'd, you know, make some other story. And I would say, why would you do that? This is a great distillery. I want to talk about it. Yeah, right. It's like, that gives me street cred. Right. So for Cooley's, we were proud. Cooley's had won like, you know, best distiller in the world. They won countless awards. We talked about it, put on the label. Same thing with Lawrenceburg. We said, it's phenomenal whiskey. This is, there's, there's no corn in this rye whiskey. Right. People used to make it like this back in the old days, but now every, you know, back then, uh, all the rye coming out of Kentucky. Right, 51% corn, corn. Nothing wrong with that. 51% rye. No, by the way, 40, not, and nothing right. wrong with that. I love corn. It's great flavor. And I love rye with corn, the mash bill. But it's different flavor. And so we, we really love that rye grain. The more rye you have in there, the more that rye flavor. So this is like a rye drinker's rye. So we yeah. were just proud to talk about it. Um, we always talked about it, so we didn't get any of that trouble, you know, with that stuff. Um, and we were, we were happy to talk about it. So we, we were just, you know, we were transparent and honest. We competed on price. Um, and that's why I think it was partially hit as well. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so the bourbon, did, is, was that, is that MGP or is that? So, yeah, Lauren, what's in 1776 rye okay. is now. We've had a little bit we put out, we worked with. Uh, I mean, the bourbon. Yeah. So that is MGP. Yeah, right? sorry. Okay. The, yeah. the bourbon 76 rye, we've worked with also the Barstown Bourbon Company. Okay. So some, right. it has been uh, for the bourbon, Barstown Bourbon Company. Okay. Right. Um, and Great guys, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Great, great people, great team over there. Yeah. Um, we were actually the first to work with them ever at anybody. Seriously. Very, very quickly became their smallest partner because they had such great success. <laughs> Kudos to them. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and uh, great people <laughs> over there, you know, Dave yep. Mandel, you know, yep. oh, yeah. Steve Nally, John Hargrove, really yep. great people, did something very cool over there. 
Um, and we were just sort of at a segue while we were getting our distillery rebuilt. And we said we want to make a little bit more whiskey, so we did with them. Uh, but again, very involved in the production. You know, yeah, we're there. Right. We're checking chemistry. You know, we're sitting right. in barrels. Like it's like a test kitchen. You know, you're in there and you're making your whiskey the way you want to make it. Which uh, a lot of I mean, I think some people don't understand that because when you say you're getting your whiskey from another source, if people just think, oh, you're going out and buying barrels, and that's not at all what happens when you're dealing with something like that. I mean, you're involved with every stage of the process. I Everything. Mean, yeah. I mean, you know, we're calling out the yeast, you know, we're calling out right. the cook temps, you know, we're calling out the fermentation process, you know, it, yeah, everything. Um, and yeah, so, and, and even if you're having it distilled with your recipe, it's not like you just drop off a recipe card, <laughs> no. come back and yeah, right. pick up some barrels. Like, hey, thanks years for the barrels, later. guys. Yeah, See you later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. appreciate it. Not at all. You don't just <laughs> now there it. there are every distillery does have its unique fingerprint also. You yeah. Know? So there is something to be said about the spirit and and certain nuance to a distillery. So right. you can talk to the most brilliant, you know, master distillers alive, which I've had this conversation with, and I've t we've talked about what happens if you, at the same, at two different distilleries, you make try to make the exact same whiskey, exact same recipe, gra same grain source, same yeast, same cook process, fermentation, same cook, everything you like. You get close, you get in the ballpark. But they're all like, yeah, yeah. you're gonna get exactly. Yeah. You know, they all got their own little bugs, you know, some got good bugs, some got bad bugs, you know, oh, yeah. they all add a little bit of different flavor to it, Sure, but they will just tell you we've, and cause they've tried it. A lot of times they've tried to do this for, for blending reasons. And they will say, you, you get very close, but you're not gonna be exactly on. So, um, we're always in the ballpark. If we do that, you no, know, we're, we're able to dial in pretty close. So we get, we get pretty close. Um, but this is also what is exciting about what we're doing in Lexington, you know, putting right. our own fingerprint on the whiskey. Yeah. Yep. So when you're blending these though, you are blending to a specific profile. So batch after batch, release after release, it's always going to be the same. The, the 1776 Ride and Bourbon, yeah. that's going to have we, the same. We want, we really admire consistency. Okay. You know, I, I think there's something to be said for beautiful one-offs, but there's also something to be said when you're trying to build a brand. Right. And when you really value that a consumer, a whiskey fan is like, hey, I'm putting down my hard-earned money and buy a bottle of whiskey. And then six months later, I'm going to do it again. Or I'm going to go order a, you know, a shot in a, in a bar. Right. Mm -mm. Like you want to deliver for them because if they have an experience and they like it, you want to deliver. Mm -hmm. And so I have some of the most, you know, I admire greatly large distilleries like makers, or other people who are able to do things on a much bigger scale and be super consistent in their flavor profile. So we really strive to be, um, you know, model ourselves after them on some products. Now, sure. Some things are just experimental and we, we design them by nature and releases, but for something like 1776, no, we want to be consistent. We right. want to deliver the same experience to consumers. Speaking of experimental, let's talk about this single malt. So just will this be something that you guys are going to release this, you think? Or is this just something? Single malt? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll it, be, we'll release it. Okay. That's We've what, actually put a little bit out. We've, yep, under the okay. radar, put a couple of single barrels out in our retail of our own stuff. From okay. Single malts to rise, but we just don't make a big stink about it. I got you. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. But Matt, a lot. what do you think in terms of taste, man? Well, first off, I'm definitely going to have to find out when you put one of these out because this is excellent. I'm not much one much for single malts. Yeah. But this is really, really good. I agree. It is. It's it's, it's very unique. I, I really enjoy it. It's got a nice spicy yep. up front, but it's not like overly spicy, but a good amount of heat. Picking up that, that grassy, a little bit of that earthy, but it's got those bright flavors. Again, that apricot's coming through for me. There's just like that toasty toastiness i think of the malt is coming through and then that that like milk chocolate finish that creamy mouth coating long chocolatey finish yeah with it like this is this is really excellent thank you I, i'm not again not really one much for single malts but this is really good i'm gonna find out when you're putting these bottles out and i'm coming by I'll let you know. Yeah, I appreciate <laughs> so, that. Great. So I was saying dill. So after I, you said grass and then you said grass and I was thinking something when I tasted it when I was a kid here, I'm going to go back to my childhood, right? <clears throat> I used to get the sour grass. Did you guys ever see sour grass had like the little yellow teeny tiny flowers with it? And like if you were really thirsty or your mouth was dry, you could actually pluck the leaves off of this. We call it sour grass. You could just chew on that and it would, it was so, it was sour. Um, but it was grassy, but it would actually activate your, your saliva glands and you could like refresh your mouth. I mean, it's kind of funny, but when you're a kid and you're outside for 12 hours a day and you don't want to go back inside and get a drink of water, we would actually do that and it would be like, okay, we're good to go again, you know? But it was that little bit of a grassy, um, I don't, it's not, and this isn't sour, but that's kind of what it reminded me of in terms of the grassiness. 
uh, was as a kid that that little sour grassiness, um, which which I really enjoy. So, but it's got that that um, spiciness as well, Matt. Like you said, mm -hmm. a little bit of a chalk, kind of a chocolatey uh, finish as well, uh, and the finish lingers just like the uh, the bourbon. I mean, there's a nice linger on this on this finish as well. So. Yeah, I'm a fan. I'm not usually a single malt drinker at all because I don't I don't seek it out. I don't I don't look for it. But this is really good. Well, because it was aged in the old bourbon barrel, it's got a little bourbon. Ah, too, there you so, go. You okay. Know, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But no, it's it's great. And you know, we look. We do a lot of experimentation at the distillery. Mm -hmm. We have fun, and you know, it, not everything turns out so great. Right. Nothing turned out bad or horrible, mm -hmm. but some things turn out like, eh, you know, right. And then other things we just try. And we're like, yeah, this is fun. And we, you know, we know we like something when we do a tasting panel and then like we're done with the work part of it and then we just kind of sit around and we're kicking back. <laughs> we like, see what everyone kind of keeps sipping on. Taste, we'll taste a little bit we more of this. We start talking yeah. just like this, yeah. you know, and you're like, and this is one of, you know, yeah. we just like it. And so, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm glad you guys enjoy it. That's yeah. a good reason. Yeah. So anytime you need help on the tasting panel, you know, please just, you know, reach out and let the bourbon life know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you guys up on it. It'd be great. You're We'd right be here. more than happy to come down, you know, be part of your, your tasting panel with you. But um, so let's talk about a little bit about the history and we can kind of start this conversation and we'll pick it up in round three. Um, but talk about the history about Pepper himself, James Pepper. Can you kind of talk about that? Um, what got you intrigued and how you really got into that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, <sighs> It's such a great story. I thought um, you're looking at you're like no no no. I'm looking no. at my watch to see how much no, time. No 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 no. I'm sort of like <laughs> how much time do we have? It's here? like a it's a meditative <laughs> move for me to like uh, retrench because I was going to say I can I can talk for an hour or two hours nonstop about the history. Yeah yeah. Um and it, it's so remarkable. Um and so like you know I'm trying to like think about how do I frame it all let's, in a time. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say let's let's do like a, a five or ten minute like intro sure. kind of frame it up and then we'll take a break and then sure. we can come back and finish that and talk so, about some other things. Let's talk about the Pepper brand really got to start with Elijah Pepper. Okay. Who um was from I think originally Culpeper, Virginia, what is Culpeper today. Um this is during, you know, the seventeen seventies. He's a young man. Um family legend has it he began distilling during the American Revolution. You know, this is before Kentucky was a state, it's part of Virginia. Right. Mm -hmm. He then heads west, like a lot of pioneers, settles near present day Versailles, Kentucky, builds a distillery in 1812 by Glens Creek. That property today goes by the name of Woodford Reserve. Yeah. A little, little brand you all might have heard. <laughs> so when, when Elijah passes away, his son Oscar takes over the property. Oscar expands the distillery, hires a Scottish chemist by the name of Dr. James C. Crow. Old Crow Whiskey. Oh, yeah. He's a master oh, yeah. distiller. And as you're talking, I'm just going to pour myself another little bit. So you just keep talking. That's the best <laughs> sign right there, man. I love seeing it. So, so hires James C. Crow. They perfect what is known as the sour mash process. Mm -hmm. Process used today by virtually every large distillery in Kentucky. What this did is it, it ensured quality and consistency from one batch of whiskey to the next. You know, you're taking a bit of the spent mash, you're putting in the next fermenter, passes along a lot of good enzymes, bacteria. And, you know, in the mid-1800s, there wasn't, well, whiskey was, it wasn't always good whiskey, right? There was a lot of bad whiskey. <laughs> yeah. So lots of funky stuff in there, right? This was really, again, before whiskey was, there were brands of whiskey. This was when whiskey was like an agricultural product that farmers, how do you use excess grain? You distill it. That's what Elijah did, right? That's what all early distillers did. But this made Old Crow and Old Pepper whiskey famous because it was so good. Mm -hmm. So it was a favorite whiskey of Ulysses S. Grant, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, on and on and on. Um, there's even a famous story where during the Civil War, one of the generals was complaining to Lincoln that Grant drank too much. Yeah. And Grant famously replied, if one of you can tell me what brand he drinks, I would gladly send a barrel of it to every general in the field. <laughs> <laughs> and he was talking about whiskey produced at the old Oscar Pepper, Pepper distillery how funny. produced by Crow. And uh, they, they didn't yeah. sell whiskey in bottles back then. It was sold by the barrel. So old Crow became famous, old Pepper became famous. So when Oscar Pepper dies... His son, young Jamesy e. Pepper, takes over the business. He was 15 years old at the time. Now he's 15, and they've got quite the, the ongoing concern. I mean, really, again, this is like the first famous brand in Kentucky. There's no such thing as brands until that distillery yeah. put, a, put a name and a brand to it. Mm -hmm. So they've got this concern, and the family says, you, you need help. You're 15. Um, so they bring in an old family friend and guardian uh, to help him out. His name was Colonel E.H. Taylor. <laughs> okay. Well, That's crazy. You guys might have heard of that guy yeah, too, right? We've heard of him. Mm -hmm. so, His name's been kicked around 
Yeah, I might. There might be a bottle or four or five over there. With yeah, that. another yeah. one of these bourbon industry, you know, bourbon historic icons. Uh, a lot of this stuff to me, I tell these stories, and it's like it's an old soap opera. It's like an old episode <laughs> of Dallas. It's so over the top. I can't believe it's a true story, and this is all true. Yeah. So Taylor comes in, actually became James's legal guardian, and helps advise this young James because he had worked with Oscar in the whiskey business. Oscar Pepper was the person who got introduced sort of E.H. Taylor into the business. So the Peppers brought. EH want to get into it, and he got into it with the peppers. So he's advising young James, and he says, hey, you should expand this distillery. And you know what? I'll even loan you money to do that. <laughs> so James borrowed money. They expanded it. A couple of years go by, whatever it is, a few years. And James has financial problems with the distillery, and so did Taylor. And long story short, Taylor had to call in the loan. Yeah. They seized the distillery, took it from James E. Pepper, and couple years later, it was resold to LeBro and Graham. And that's how it left the Peppers. But the Peppers gotcha. built that old site, a lot of the old buildings, and ran it for 150 years, whatever it was. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's just because we had Paul Picoult, and we talked about the story, the Buffalo Trace story, mm -hmm. and we talked about Taylor and his issues that he had with, um, with uh, was it Weller? Who was it that he had? He had problems with them. They had legal batter, battles and fault fought back and forth and whatnot. So it's just kind of funny because you think about these brands and these guys, you think, oh, they're hugely successful. Yeah. But then you're like, there's a lot of shit going on. Between, there was a lot of shit. <laughs> between yeah. these guys, man, it's it, like crazy. It was a wild time. Yeah. And there was, there was, I mean, there's stories about everybody getting, having them problems. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. And Taylor and Pepper actually remained friends. I think there's a lot of old correspondence between them after, and they worked together in the Bottle and Bond Act. Um, so James O, he was really well connected. He had traveled a lot to sell. So he went to New York, New York City, raised money from a wine merchant, a guy named George Starkweather, came back to Lexington and on Manchester built a distillery in 1880 that at the time was the largest, most technologically advanced distillery in the United States. Wow. It was all operated by steam. He worked with a really famous architect, um, really, really advanced for the time and made old pepper whiskey there, you know, was a big flamboyant promoter of it. Um, you know, would travel around the country to promote it. Um, use his old grandfather Elijah's Revolutionary War recipes, sure, uh, as he said, and that's why he called it Old 1776 was his nickname for the brand. Nice. That's why we have 1776 Ryan Bourbon. Um, he was pretty innovative in the industry, like Taylor. You know, trying to advance. He was one of these producers of high grade Kentucky whiskey, and he's very proud of it. Proud, yeah. proud of that. Proud of his family legacy in that. And there was a lot of people making really bad things back in those days. There was actually no consumer protection laws. There was no trademark laws. So people would put horrible things in a bottle and put in some kind of coloring and turpentine and yeah, tobacco, right. juice, tobacco juice, juice spit or whatever. Whatever. Yeah. And you could put whiskey, you call it whatever you want yeah. to call it, bourbon. And there's no law to say you couldn't do it. And James E. Pepper, the law in the 1880s, a distillery actually couldn't sell its own, bottle its own whiskey. They had to sell by the barrel to a rectifier uh, who then bottle it. So James E. Pepper didn't like that because people would knock off his whiskey, counterfeit it. So he actually right. sued the state of Kentucky to change that law. Nice. And he got it changed. It started of bottles whiskey at the distillery. And that, you know, was really monumental. That was a huge turning point in the, hi in the, in the history of Kentucky bourbon sure. and American whiskey. Um, and he's really proud of that. He, on his labels, you can see them in our museum or on the website or on that little video on our website. Um, he put distillery bottling. He's really proud of that. But people would still actually take his bottles and then refill them, you know, refill them that way. <laughs> and he was furious. He would used to sue people for, for doing that. But, it's like, welcome to the secondary market, right? No. <laughs> you know, in a way, kind of, but a worse one. Yeah. Uh, but there was no trademark law back then. It was very weak. So he couldn't sue him for trademark infringement. So he had actually this ingenious idea. He realized that forgery law was really strong. So he said, I'm going to print a little strip of paper. I'm going to call it a signature strip stamp. And I'm going to seal it over the top of the bottle with my signature. And we're going to advise consumers, don't buy a bottle of our whiskey unless you see this unbroken signature strip stamp across the stopper. Nice. And if anybody knocked that off, he'd sue them for forgery infringement. And that idea became so popular that all the, a lot of other distillers incorporated it. And then a few years later, when the Bottle and Bond Act passed in 1897, that was the first consumer protection law ever passed in America, right. by the way. I, I love to point out that we had our priorities straight. Before food, <laughs> before we, medicine. We got the whiskey. We, we got to make sure <laughs> what straight whiskey, what whiskey, good whiskey is, is, is clarified. And they took that idea from James E. Pepper and adapted it into the tax tax strip yeah. that is yeah. what you see. So every time you see a, a bottle with a strip stamp on it today, thank you, James E. Pepper. That was his. Invention. That's very cool. 
Yeah. So really, again, and then he changed later the label where it said distillery bottling. He changed that to bottled and bond. So he was one of the big advocates for the bottle and bond act along with Taylor. And so he was really, you know, pivotal, you know, played a very important role in Kentucky bourbon and American whiskey at that same era as Taylor. Yeah. Um, and then he was just this larger than life character. So yeah. he was this flamboyant promoter, traveled the country in a private rail car called the old pepper painted with his label. <laughs> he was big into thoroughbred horses, uh, owned one of the finest stables, uh, in the country at the time. It was called Meadowthorpe, which today is a subdivision, a residential uh, right, subdivision right, right near a distillery. By the time it, he, when he bought it, it was the highest price ever paid for a thoroughbred horse farm. Wow. Um, and horse racing at the time in America was the biggest sport. Um, Boxing was pretty big, but it was just really horse racing and boxing. So if you were big in horse racing, you were famous across the country. So he was really famous for horses and whiskey. And whiskey. And we have just hundreds of articles, newspaper articles, about him and his business dealings, his horse racing, his whiskey, like over 80 original New York Times articles from that era. Wow. Um, that from the 1890s, early 1900s, uh, covering his dealings in whiskey and horses and when he would check in at the Waldorf Astoria, they'd print a little blurb. So it'd be like, <laughs> Prince Oflosky from Prussia checked in along with James E. Pepper, the famous distiller. But, wow. you know, lots of this stuff. So he was big in horses and big in whiskey. Uh, and again, just this larger in life character. Um, and, um, you know, he, he was actually so big that he got in a little financial trouble again <laughs> in the 1890s. Oh, and man. had to declare bankruptcy again. Yeah. Um, well, let's take a break. There. All right. We'll save we'll, and we'll come back to that. You're we'll good. Take a break. This is like Breaking Bad. You know how to stop on a, <laughs> and I leave a cliffhanger, man. Yeah, know, so you like, got to tune in. I know who uh, Tim Smith. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you ever watched Moonshiners oh, yeah. or not, but yeah, yeah. So Tim was on the show. And uh, he was talking to us. He's like, now, now, when we're doing the show, now that's that's what they call the they call it the the cliffhanger, man. So they they tell you you got to stop doing what you're doing so you can come back and everybody come up, everybody's gonna come back and watch the rest of the show, you know. So, <laughs> like, thanks, Tim. We'll do that, man. We'll do some cliffhangers. So <laughs> uh, there you go, man. He's right on. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's take a quick break, get some more uh, from our sponsors, and we'll be back with more with Amir Pay uh, from James E. This James E. Pepper Distilling. See, I'm I'm throwing myself off. It's called Pepper. Pepper. We'll be back with Pepper in just a minute. Everybody sit tight. We'll be right back. Three Chords line of whiskeys embody the spirit of creativity. The whiskey is a true collaboration between producer and composer Neil Giraldo and master blender distiller Ari Sussman. The Three Chord team of expert blenders, coopers, and sensory professionals have developed a multi-step process they call perfectly tuned taste. This process begins by carefully selecting the finest bourbon and rye whiskeys from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Indiana, and then blending them together. Find out more about the whiskeys and distribution in your area at www.threecordbourbon.com. Spirits of French Lick crafts their spirits using only the finest agricultural product that has defined character, following their motto, respect the grain. They lead the way in representing the quality of the Hoosier artisan distilling process while paying tribute to its inseparable past. By implementing best practices from those early times, combined with modern touches, Spirits of French Lick has created a truly unique place in the industry. Spirits of French Lick products are distributed throughout Indiana, Kentucky, and Missouri, and can also be purchased online through Sealbox at sealbox.com. Visit spiritsoffrenchlick.com to learn more information and make sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. All right, everybody, welcome back for the third and final round period session, whatever you want to call it, of the Bourbon Life Podcast. I'm your host, Mark, coming to you live from the Bourbon Life Studios with my good friend, my co-host, my bourbon and rye drinking buddy, Matt, wearing his beanie tonight. Matt, how you doing over there? Oh, Mark, I'm doing great. Yeah. Doing really great. And we left a cliffhanger. We did. Dun, dun, dun. That's right. With Amir Pei, the owner of Old Pepper, James E. Pepper, <laughs> however you want to call it, Pepper <laughs> Distillery here in Lexington. But before we get to that cliffhanger, we've got the FKO poured up. So FKO. What, what is it? What do we have poured up, Amir? What is the FKO? Well, the FKO is, is a really fun release we do once a year. FKO stands for Finest Kentucky Oak. Um, this is one we started to do about three or four years ago um, when we you know, really started the distillery up and we got really deep into type of oak we were using, where it comes from, uh, amount of air seasoning, um, you know, different toast and char levels. And we wanted to do a secondary finish uh, on, on our rye. And um, we said, let's do it in Kentucky oak. Let's use 
oak that's been air seasoned for two years, 24 months. The average wow. whiskey barrel is air seasoned for about six months. Yeah. When you air season a little bit longer, you break down some of those tannins in the wood that can cause some, some harsh notes. Uh, you release some of the more vanillins in there. So some really nice things can happen. And when we were thinking about the name for it, we said, well, wh what does this barrel really mean? Well, this is the finest Kentucky oak for a barrel. So we said, let's just call it FKO, FKO. finest Kentucky oak. Nice. So we take our fully mature rye and we finish it in a second barrel that is a you know toasted barrel with, you know, lightly charred, made out of this finest Kentucky oak. Um, the first year we did it, we released it uh, in 2018. Um, the first release won Best Rye Whiskey in the World at the 2018 New York World Spirits Competition. Wow. Um, and then since then, we've gotten really phenomenal, you know, double gold San Francisco, great whiskey advocate reviews, other great reviews. People really, really have enjoyed it. Um, and it's one that we do very limited release every year because we keep trying to hone and in on it and dial in. We're always trying to make our whiskeys better. And this is one we're not looking to put out a lot. We're just looking to have fun and experiment yeah. and make it better. And we feel like it's been getting better and better every year. And actually we feel like this year was the best batch we ever put out. Nice. And Matt. Then, yeah. Cause Matt's a big rye fan. So mm -hmm. then, then which one did you say? You, did you get the first release of this ever? I did. Is I it? got first release. And I think I have okay. the last release from the old bottle style. I don't know when you switch to this bottle and different bottle and label, yeah. but I have one of the other older ones. Yeah, we went from the dark bottle to the taller clear bottle. I think it was 2019 or 20, I can't recall. But okay. yeah. Very same same whiskey, different bottle though. Yeah. Yeah. Same process. So this is the same rye. Um right. same rye mash bill. So MGP. Yes. Right. Or and then still. Yeah. And then put it into the secondary barrel. Um and that's a unused new barrel. Is that right? Or is that a is the secondary barrel? New barrel, correct. New barrel. New yeah. Okay. And this is uh what was the proof again? I'm sorry. Hundred and eight point four. Okay. Cast gotcha. strength. Gotcha. Very nice. Matt, what do you pick up on the nose, man? It's got, well, of course, pick up the oak, like, right away. Nice oakiness, but it's not overblown. Like, some secondary oak finisher, toasted oak barrels, where you just, like, you're completely blown out. It's got a nice subtlety. It's restrained on the oak, but it's definitely there. And then I pick up, like, sweet sorghum, like nougat on it as well but there's some zest there's some citrus like a little orange or that apricot i think might be coming out again just yeah what a, a super nice inviting kind of smoky yeah yeah that smokiness i, I yeah. get that smokiness to it um, a little nice. bit of the rye spiciness unfortunately i i took a restroom break during the break <laughs> and washed my hands so i keep smelling uh, hand soap too i'm like i was like trying to get away from the hand soap versus the rye, but I can, I'm can. i definitely smelling it, picking it up, Matt. I, I, I get it. What about you, Amir? I haven't even asked you in terms of the nosing because you're like, Matt says whatever, and I agree with him, and then forget to ask you. I'm well, sorry about that. I, I'm more interested in what you guys think, actually. <laughs> right. um, you guys have much more eloquent, better descriptions, I think, than I come no, up Matt with. No, Matt does. I just, uh, I just say yes. <laughs> once again, you just say it confidently enough, people agree. That's how I've made it through 104 episodes. There you go, yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, for me, it's, it's got a big mouthfeel to it. Okay. A lot of flavor, a lot of body to it, right? Very oily. Um, but I, I think, you know, you're spot on that that not too much oak. You got to be careful of these secondary finishes in a new oak barrel that the oak doesn't dominate the whiskey. Um, I get candied orange peels. Okay. A little candied citrus note. It's there. It's in the background more. You know, it's mm -hmm. like that. What I love about rye whiskey is it's a very vibrant, flavorful whiskey. Get a lot of minty cloves, eucalyptus notes. Um, you know, and then those kind of that, that fruit, if you will, just kind of gets candied, right. And just mm -hmm. sort of gets this big mouthfeel to it. So a lot of vanilla, um, just a great mouth, very rich whiskey, yeah. you know, the kind of whiskey you drink with like a, eat Man, with like a, a I just a, took my first taste. You yeah. could tell I was like, and I'm not going to talk about it yet, but I was just like, Oh, <laughs> like a dessert, almost like a dessert whiskey, oh, right. Just, just, Oh yeah. yeah. I'm not going to jump into that yet, but yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, say we had a cliffhanger. Let's yeah. get, let's jump back into that. Talking about a second, uh, uh, another bankruptcy. Another uh, bankruptcy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so 1890s, Jamesy e. Peppers living high on the hog, <laughs> big in whiskeys, big in horses, <laughs> um, overproduction in the whiskey industry. Yeah. Very competitive market. Can't pay his bills. Goes, has to declare bankruptcy. So the bank, or he's insolvent, but either way, the bank sees the distillery, sees all his horses. So they go to the bank goes to auction off his horses at Lexington, um, and this is where we get to introduce one of our favorite peppers, 
maybe my favorite, maybe the best pepper of them all, honestly. Dr. Pepper. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> no, he goes late. no, I'm just joking. Uh, no relation to the Dr. Pepper. Just FYI, everybody. Uh, but this is where we introduced James E. Pepper's wife, Ella Offit Pepper. Nice. Who we love talking about in the distillery and the museum uh, and in that little documentary. So Ella comes and she goes to the downtown. And she bids on her husband's horses. And when everybody in Lexington saw, oh, this is the wife of Colonel Pepper's bidding to win her husband's horses back, no one bid against her, and she won them for a song. That was what really? the newspapers wrote. Nice. She then took those horses and went out and raced them. Now, she'd always been involved in the horses. And, you know, James E. Pepper, he, boy, he was big, right? He, he raced his horses in the Derby, the Oaks. He won the Oaks. He never won the Derby. Um, came in second or third, actually, Isaac Burns Murphy, a great, famous African-American jockey right, still right. holds all-time greatest win percentage. Great, great guy. Rode for James E. Pepper. There we actually. have a new park, or fairly new yeah. park downtown. Yeah. And, and, after him. Right. and he rode for him, and they were actually per, you know, friends. So like, um, so he did well, but he never won the—he didn't win the Derby. Um, and more importantly, he didn't really make money with the horses. <laughs> he spent money on them. Uh, he wasn't really a seller. He was a buyer, you know, and a breeder. Uh, yeah. Uh, but when Ella raced, she not only won a lot of races, but she was really savvy about— when to sell a horse and how to get the most money. And she made so much money racing and selling horses that she was actually able to stake James to buy the distillery back out of foreclosure. Really, And that story became a national news headline story. Wow. Um, we have dozens of articles about Ella Offit Pepper saving her husband's distillery, repairing his fortune. She got the, the nickname, the Queen of the Turf, and actually went on to have this great racing career on her own. Uh, she actually served as a, the president of the distillery as well. And, you know, to put it in perspective, this was a time when women didn't have the right to vote in the United States. Sure, yeah. yeah. And and here she is in this sport that is the biggest sport, the sport of kings, the biggest sport in the U.S. Women don't have the right to vote, and she's killing everybody, <laughs> killing them. And so she became famous in her own right. And and after, you know, they resurrected the, the racing stable and, and, and the distillery, they were just the ultimate power couple. You know, again, this gets back to this is like this soap opera. This is like, it's, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's larger than life. You can't believe this is all true. And it is. And they traveled the world. They, they actually once brought their horses to England to race against the King of England in the Doncaster Cup. And they beat him. They won the race. And they brought the trophy back here to Lexington. And it's at the Horse Park Museum right now. Really? It's the only time that the trophy's ever left England. Um, wow. this is all, it's really cool. You know, it's remarkable story. Can you imagine, by the way, in the 1890s or early 1900s, putting horses on a boat yeah, and no. going over to Europe? I mean, so this is the life they lived and they, they spent a lot of time in New York city at the Waldorf Astoria hotel, the Waldorf at that time, uh, the turn of the last century was the place to be in New York. This is where the Vanderbilts, the Carnegie's, the Rockefeller's, Buffalo Bill Cody. I yeah. mean, anybody who was anybody was at the Waldorf, the old Waldorf. And they were big there. James E. Pepper would put on events in the ballroom for the, liquor, the Brooklyn Liquor Dealers Association, all these really great things. A very famous story has it that, and this was printed in a very famous cocktail book called The Waldorf Story, a bar book of classic pre-prohibition recipes uh, published in 1934 at the end of Prohibition. Story has it that that the old-fashioned cocktail was invented in honor of James E. Pepper at the Pendennis Club in Louisville, and then he brought it to the Waldorf, and really? from there it was introduced to the world. Hmm. Thank you, James Pepper, man, because that's that's probably my favorite cocktail. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Man. It's literally the number one selling cocktail in the United States, and that's and crazy. It, it's a great story. You know, it's it's um, it's uh, just you know one of many of these great stories. Yeah, um, and so they just had this really fascinating life. Um, and then tragically, unfortunately, in December 24th, Christmas Eve, ni uh, 1906, they were in Manhattan staying at the Waldorf, and James E. Pepper slipped on an icy sidewalk, broke his leg, severe fracture, got a really bad infection, and died at the Waldorf Astoria in Manhattan. No kidding. Yep. Wow. Isn't that crazy, man? I mean, you just, well, you don't think about that stuff, obviously, these days, um, that you'd slip and fall and get an infection. I, I think this is before penicillin. I was like, I mean, say, yeah, just, it's yeah. Like, yeah. So, Medicine has advanced many years, right? Yeah. So, uh, so he, yeah, crazy. So he unfortunately passes away. At out, the Waldorf. At the Waldorf. Yeah, hey, if you're going to go, though, yeah. you know, go in style, right? And by the way, there was this huge New York Times article, like headline article, Colonel Pepper dead, you know, and then what happened to Waldorf? And then it says, 
his his uh, what was the story? His wife, his his finances once bankrupted him, then Mrs. Pepper, you know, won enough to save them. And re- I mean, it's this great story. So all these articles in the New York Times, and then covering how after he died, Ella Pepper was like distraught, and they had to bring in doctors, and like you know, just had to transport the body. So it's really well covered this historical event. Yeah. And uh, you know, they brought him back to Lexington. He's buried at the old cemetery here. He's got a great tomb. Okay. His dying wish was that a statue of Ella be erected over his tomb. That actually became a national news headline story because it was kind of this macabre uh-huh. dying wish. But but it was a, mm-hmm. such a great love story, really, yeah. between them. Um, apparently, that never happened. The statue never went up. Uh, we met, you know, one of the first things I started do, looking for when I did research all these years ago, I went to the, the, the cemetery and I found the tomb and I was like, where's the statue? <laughs> where's the statue? And it wasn't there. And I went yeah. to the, the, the office for the, the, the cemetery. I said, what happened to the statue? And they said, we don't know. We, we were looking through old files. And they're like, we have no record of it. Huh. I said, God, what happened? And then a few years ago, the great, great niece of Ella Offit Pepper actually came into our distillery and said, you know, I have all these personal artifacts of Ella and James um, personal mementos, photographs, Jamesy Pepper's wallet with the logo in it, uh, hairbrushes, furniture, f- uh, photo, I mean, just love letters, all these things. I'd like to donate them to you. Oh, wow. And so it was great. We loved it. Um, and she was awesome. And one of the big questions I had is, why didn't, what happened to the statue? She mm-hmm. was like, well, I don't think, you know, she wanted the statue to go up. She thought it was a little weird. She's alive. No, she's alive statue. and there's a statue of her. So in apparently the she 86 yeah. it, but I got you. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah. And nobody can compete with the Henry Clay statue down there. Oh, right? exactly. So it's like you can't, you know. Why try? Yeah. yeah. Why even why even why even waste the money, right? So <laughs> they had no children. Um so Ella Pepper sold the distillery to a group of investors. Yeah. Um, sold off the entire racing stable except one horse, Prince Pepper who legend has it the Imperial Stud Farmer of Japan had once offered any sum of money. Really? And she kept just that one horse. Wow. Um, and Ella, you know, went on to actually have a very interesting life. Uh, we'll talk about later at some point. You know, she was really a remarkable woman, um, just just really remarkable. So, but she exited, you know, the, the distillery and the, and the whiskey brand, and this investors took it over, and they ran it up until Prohibition, and Prohibition hits. Uh, pepper whiskey was sold during Prohibition, one of a handful of brands sold for medicinal purposes. Um, we've, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. As we're going to test you right now. Yeah. Uh, I have these great old ads that say that, you know, old pepper whiskey clinically endorses clinically pure by 37,814 doctors. <laughs> it's really weird numbers. There's three ads. First was 30,000 doctors. Then it was 37,814. <laughs> then it was 40,000. And all these ads said, copies of the letters on file, on file. in our distillery. <laughs> nice. Now, I've been doing historical research for 15 years. I have an archives. We have a museum. The one thing I haven't been able to find out of these 40,000 letters is... Yeah. You know, one, one letter that actually says yeah, that, yeah. right? But so it's like four out of five dentists recommend. So it's like, no, we've got like 400 or 45,000, 35,000 doctors. Right. So, but it's Crazy. a good story. <laughs> um, and it, the ads are, tr- are real. So um, sold for medicinal purposes during Prohibition. Uh, 1933, the old distillery, the property burned in a fire. And 1934, the repeal of Prohibition in Kentucky was rebuilt on the exact same footprint okay. uh, by the Shenley Corporation. Um, so they relaunched, you know, or the brand kept it going. Um, and it continued to be, you know, produced and marketed. It was one of the, you know, heaviest marketed produced whiskey brands, bourbon brands in, in Kentucky and the U S uh, you know, thirties, forties, fifties. Um, and then up in the, um, you know, sixties whiskey industry, bourbon industry had hard times. Uh, there's over the dark ages, yeah. dark ages. There was too many distilleries built. Um, vodka became popular. And so in 1967, uh, a lot of other distilleries were shut down. In 67, the Pepper Distillery in Lexington was shut down and abandoned along with the brand uh, for over 50 years. Wow. Yeah. And then you came along. Then I come along. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so now, but you started the brand well before, I mean, but you've redone the whole distillery, right? So, I mean, the brand, you were actually working on the brand before? Yeah. So okay. I discovered the brand. As I was saying earlier, through yeah. that you know that famous boxing match that they sponsored in 1910, which was an awesome event to sponsor, um, and just became intrigued with it. And I had relaunched the brand, and the whole time I was visiting the old distillery in Lexington, you know, in Manchester, that was abandoned, and yeah. the place was in a horrible state of disrepair. It looked mm-hmm. like Chernobyl. Yeah, and you know there was people who owned the building. You know, somebody owned the entire property, and 
And uh, this was, you know, 08, right after the real estate market crashed. Right. So like there was a grand plan to redevelop the whole area. And then at that point, anybody trying to do anything real estate was in a bad way. Mm -hmm. And this was a complicated project. I mean, it was a really bad state of disrepair. And, you know, I, I tell people about building distillery. I think a lot of people think, oh, it's like building a brewery or restaurant. I'm like, no, we're building like an ethanol refinery. <laughs> it's right. like highly regulated. You know, yeah. it's obviously very expensive to do, but but also, you know, it, so much city, state, federal oversight. Like it's, it's a serious project. It's a lot. So we can't just come in and do it, right? And I toured the, the property once with uh, one of the leading distillery engineering firms in Kentucky and... Uh, walked out, you know, after one guy turned to me and he said, Amir, I don't want to talk myself out of a job, but you should just run, <laughs> go buy a hundred acres somewhere in the middle of nowhere and just do that. Start, and let's start over. I was like, well, yeah, I hear you, but this is the spiritual home of the brand. This would be cool to rebuild it. So I was always interested to rebuild it, but you know, I didn't own the property right? and, and I couldn't just will it to happen. It had to happen, you know, it had to be thoughtful. I had to you know, make sure it made sense from a business point of view and, and the numbers worked and that, that if I was to make the commitment, it all worked. And so I just stayed, you know, in touch and, and watched the property over the years. And then eventually um, it was sold off in different parcels. So the old 25 acre property, multiple buildings was kind of subdivided up and sold to different parcels to different people. And this was really a great thing because then all these great local independent entrepreneurs came in and built these you know, started yep. to build these little businesses, yep. a couple to start, you know, um, and kind of started the, the seeds were planted for this distillery district. And, you know, the people who bought the old distillery building proper, um, a, a great partner of mine, good, great friend and friends now, uh, Chris Kelly, who lives in Lexington, owns a great, really smart guy, owns a, a structural engineering firm called Pogue Engineers. Uh -huh. um, his wife, Terry, Terry's sister, Delena, uh, they had bought the, the building, um, and you know, they wanted to renovate it and they had, you know, they owned a number of other properties around town. Uh, they had a crew of people to work. So they knew construction, you know, Chris being a structural engineer, you know, and he had another partner, Tony Higdon, who was, you know, knew how to do work and do this kind of stuff is really you know, a skilled guy for, uh, being a contractor and for, for being an artist, um, doing cool things, but they, they knew this stuff. So they reached out to me and said, hey, would you be interested in rebuilding the distillery? We heard you all the brand. I said, are you kidding me? I've been trying to do this for years. So I was like, like when can you be here? I'll be, I'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> I came out immediately mm -hmm. and started talking with everybody. And it was like, you know, all those hard questions about right, how can you do this? It's complicated. Like right. they had the answers. And and I just we, we just started to like really have a good rapport. And I started to build a lot of trust and say, you know, I think they can they can deliver on their end. And I think that they thought the same of me. Amir can deliver on his end because it was a big leap of faith for everybody. Sure. Um, and um, I think we all did. It took you know it took years to work out the deal, um, and then to announce it, and then to build it. You know, and I mean, it takes sure. it takes time to do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we did. And so you know, I feel really lucky that uh, really fortunate that I was able to bring the brand back to the old distillery. I mean, talk about the moon and stars sure. aligning oh, yeah. and no doubt, lucky man. to be a bootstrapper, um, to have that come together. And then mm -hmm. to have the people who are involved, like everybody I just mentioned at the distillery, the property, the real estate owners, and this is a forever project, obviously, right? Sure. So we're not going anywhere. And so they were, but they were great. And I think we all shared a passion. Like they, they had a passion for Lexington and the history and that history of that building. And they saw that I had a real passion for this brand and the history of the brand, do things right. And like, when, you, when you're talking to people like that and you're all like tuned up the same way, yep. like momentum carries the day. And then the city was great. I mean, you know, Mayor Jim Gray at the time. Yep. I mean, everybody from, you know, Visit Lex and just, you know, Commerce Lex. I mean, there's so much support, enthusiasm, um, again, for me, I was, you know, a boost, I still am a bootstrapper. Right. Uh, but I was, I built my business up to the point where a bank finally said, yeah, we'll loan you all the money to do this. <laughs> that's so, crazy. So that's, that's what we did. And most importantly, you have a place to store all that O'Sullivan whiskey that's left over. Now you have, no, I'm just kidding. No, actually, I don't, I don't know that label anymore. Uh, <laughs> just, yeah. I was just yeah. kidding. No, yeah. but that's an awesome story, man. I'm happy that's happened here in Lexington. I'm happy you're able to do that. DSP five, man. I mean, going back and getting that original to revive uh, it was yeah, pretty cool. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty impressive. I mean, that's really impressive. Uh, just the fact that you've worked so hard to, to rebrand, rebuild, resurrect, for lack of a better word, man. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. So let's kind of shift gears and talk about the, the future, um, what things are looking like. Uh, because obviously your, your contract is dealing with people, but 
you're also distilling on site. We've ha- we've had obviously your barrel number one bourbon, um, mm-hmm. some single malt as well. So can you talk a little bit about that transition, sure. how that's going to work and how, um, I mean, it's got to be a little, I don't want to say frightening, <laughs> but it's got to be yeah. a little scary to go from something you know, something you've done for years to your own, your own distillate, your own product. Sure. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, how do we do that? And, and how do we make this transition from, you know, what we've been doing with 1776 uh, and working with other distilleries to our own distillate and, and what do we do with that distillate and with these labels, right? Um, 1776 was created in a partnership with these other distilleries, right? right. And we compete on price and we compete on quality. Um, and we've always been very honest about these relationships and people love the whiskeys. I mean, we've, we can't bottle it fast enough, right? So like they're working, people love it. Uh, we have fans. We have people who drink these whiskeys all across the U.S. and internationally. Nice. And there's a certain flavor profile that they like. And, you know, we, I sat there and said, you know, we could just make it all at Lexington. Um, but, you know, is that the right thing to just do that right off the jump? You know, because we weren't sure about our production costs, although they're, they're very competitive now that we've, we've worked it out. And again, you know, I'm going this thing blind. Like, we don't know. Right. I'm not some like, you know, <laughs> MBA or like, you know, I don't run You're numbers. You're a philosophy major, man. Philosophy. What the hell do you know about making whiskey, right? I Come can drink fun. whiskey and bullshit. <laughs> there, you know, you go, there you go, But But we said, let's, let's feel this out. There's no need to rush it. So, you know, we knew, I knew we we're going to make great whiskey um, because I've been doing this for a while. So I'm not you know, new to this. Right. But more importantly, we hired a great guy to run it, Aaron Shore. She's our master distiller. You know, before Aaron joined us, he had joined us. He had almost 20 years of experience. Nice. First 10 were at Lawrenceburg. <laughs> he worked there when it was Seagram's though. Okay. Yeah. So, and by the way, anybody who came up in the Seagram's regimen to me, whether it's on the distilling or the business side, I have a lot of respect for. Yeah. Um, and, and he, so he worked at that plant, but he also was at, you know, Beam for like five years and Sam Adams for a while. And okay. so he, he, he knows what he's doing. He's a serious guy. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I also had a lot of great friends and consultants. So, you know, Dave Shurick, you know, Greg Metz, yeah. uh, Pete Kamer, uh, you know, we work with Joseph and Joseph Architects, you know, they're building 20, 50, $100 million distilleries. They work with everybody, you know, work with Vendome and Louisville. So mm-hmm. we're working with the best of the best right. in in Kentucky. Um, and we've got a great production team. And so Aaron came in, we've got a great, you know, head distiller, you know, Cody's young guy, studied chemical engineering and he's been there from day one. So we're, we're serious about making whiskey. And I, I have, again, fair amount of experience working with all these distilleries. So right. I'm not a distiller. I'll be the first one to say, <laughs> all right? Like, I know what I'm good at and what I'm not. And yeah. I'm very involved in the production of what we make and the style of whiskeys and the grain and everything. But, you know, I guess the analogy I would give is like, I'm an architect, um, but I'm not a builder. Gotcha. Uh, that makes sense. I think yep. Aaron and nice. Cody and everybody else, like, they're also architects, but they're also builders. All right. Like, yeah. so, so, like, you know, but so we're all very involved. Um, so we know the whiskey is good and it's going to be good. Um, but, you know, we're, we're trying to be thoughtful about what we do with the existing label, specifically 1776, that got us where we were. Right. Um, you, you want to be careful for flavor drift, um, you know, which, you know, we could hit the recipes, kind of like we were saying earlier, very close. Sure. But, you know, you got to be thoughtful about it. So what we're going to do later this year, we're going to start blending a little bit of our in-house whiskeys with Lawrenceburg distilled whiskeys for 1776. Okay. Um, so that we kind of, it's a sort of slow process. Right. Um, and to make sure that we don't, you know, just jump the gun. Although, we we really like our whiskeys and we feel very confident in the flavor profiles we're making mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we're going to put out new whiskeys like the old Pepper label uh, that okay. you see, you know, that we're we're drinking on now from the finest Kentucky oak um, in a new bottle that really tout that. And, and the, that was the other thing. We're really proud of what we're making at this old distillery, right? DSP Kentucky Five, and we want to make sure that we communicate to consumers like. Because everybody knows the 1776 labels were produced at other distilleries. So if we all of a sudden just put 100% of our whiskey in there, right? people might not know that forever, for, like for years. Like, mm-hmm. And you know, on one hand, you say, well, what's the problem? I don't know. But like, we are really proud of that. So we wanted to take the opportunity to talk about that. And so that's why to your you know, early part of the conversation, you're like, well, are you Jamesy Pepper, Old Pepper? We're like... 
We're a little bit of everything. <laughs> and like, that's why with Zolpep, we're really going to talk about that provenance. Uh, so we're really proud of that. So we're going to yeah. have these new product lines, packages that really highlight, you know, whiskeys that were 100% distilled in Lexington. So it's very clear to consumers what's in every product, what's in every bottle. Gotcha. So what you're making now here, you're sourcing grains. Are you getting that lo- everything locally or for the most part as much as you can? Or All of our corn is grown by a local farmer in Fayette County, 100%. Oh, okay. All right. Um, we've grown some rye, um, but rye is tricky in Kentucky. Yeah, right. Um, the first year we were in production, we had a crop come in and we produced it. And the next year, the crop just failed. Yeah. And our farmer's like, yeah, it just failed. Sorry. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. we yeah. we tried to, and it's great farmers. It wasn't his fault. It's right. just, it's, it's, it, it's tricky to grow out here. And it, this is something that's important. You know, you got to be thoughtful about how you make whiskey and where grain is grown, right? So corn grows phenomenally well in Kentucky. Rye, not as well. Right. It grows much better in colder northern climates, mm-hmm. really well in Europe. We also wanted to make, you know, barley, you know, grow barley in Kentucky. So right. as, as we were drinking a single malt earlier, we wanted to do 100% Kentucky malted barley, single malt, you know, and, and we grew a big crop of rye. Uh, we, we actually, and we have, we continue to work very closely with the University of Kentucky, uh, Department of Agriculture. Oh, yeah. So we, yeah, we, nice. we, we were thoughtful. We found a strain of barley that would was suitable, we thought, to grow well in the climate. We grew it. We shipped it to the malt house when it was harvested, and the malt house called us up and said, yeah, you know, you got all this mold and fungus on this barley. Uh, we can malt it for you, and you can make whiskey with it. But if this was sent to us from one of our, you know, farms in Montana, Wyoming, we'd reject it. It's up to you. What do you want to do? Oh, man. And so we had to reject it. And it was like such a buzzkill because you're like, yeah. you know, you, we want to be local right. as much, much as we can. can. Right. But, but before that, the number one goal is make high-quality whiskey. Sure. And making whiskey with mold and fungus, not like that is not high quality. And <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sad because because sometimes the tail wags the dog. So we just said, look, corn is a no brainer. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll see in the future about other grains. But um, yeah, corn is the one we grow 100% in Kentucky. So these products that are going to be coming out. So we're drinking the the FKO now, right? Um, so it's good, that's the Old Pepper brand label. So the newer products will have the Old Pepper label like this. Is yeah, that, so so we're not going to do too many labels because we're, okay. we're still relatively small producer right. for like... <laughs> we got like 18 SKUs, yeah, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> my distributor's like, slow down, Amir, slow down, dude. You're like, you, you sell in a year with Jim Beam spills on the floor in a day. So, but it, it, it's an interesting, you know, issue, as I said, you know, you, you start, you relaunch the brand before you rebuild the distillery and you do it with other distilleries. <laughs> right. We got the 1776 stuff is working great. People love it. It's in really high demand. So we don't want to stop that and mess with it, but we also want to talk about things. So the old pepper line is really going to be sort of our single barrel cast strength line of whiskeys. Okay, gotcha. Um, maybe some limited finishes, that other kind of stuff. Okay. And then later on, maybe late this year, if not early next year, we have we'll have one final package come out product. It's going to be a new custom bottle, but it's going to be based on a historic bottle from the old distillery. Okay. Um, and that's going to be one where we showcase 100% of whiskeys, you know, distilled in Lexington, um, but some innovative mash bills. And blending for us is a very important thing. Um, we we are very traditional in, you know, some of the mash bills we produce that they're historic mash bills from the old distillery, mm-hmm. uh, along with the grain palette that we use, meaning the type of grains we use. Like we haven't used wheat so far because like there's never right. any wheat. Okay. I think maybe once, but not really. It wasn't part of what James Pepper did or that distillery. Right. We love rye. So we kind of stay true in that sense. We also do a lot of innovative things um, that are kind of thoughtful innovation. Um, you know, I, I I won't get into it today because I'd like to do it at a future episode sure, with man. you guys. We'll do another one. Yeah, when, absolutely. When we have, I already feel it happening, man. Yeah, like, yeah. we're going to do it. When, when we have all these whiskeys bottled, and it'll be fun to talk about. So it's innovative, but it's thoughtfully innovative. Okay. Um, there's no weird grains in there or anything like bizarre. So it's it's innovative, <laughs> but based on tradition. No buckwheat. No, no, uh, all right. <laughs> no quinoa. None yeah. of that. Okay. Spelt or something. Yeah. Uh, although yeah. I'm sure they make fine whiskeys. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, we we, we want to innovate thoughtfully and and and, and, and rooted in tradition in a way. Um, and we feel like it's going to be fun when people see what we're doing. And part of that is going to involve blending, which we think is is an art. You sure. know, there's a great sure. saying by, I think, one of the founders of Seagram's that, that um, 
distillation is a science, blending is an art, and it really is yeah, an art. That makes sense. Um, and we're inspired by that tradition. So that'll be part of it, and that'll be coming out maybe early 2023. Okay. Great. We got we got round two coming up in just mm-hmm. another year. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, let's jump back in and talk about this FKO, man, in terms of the... I've already drank mine, obviously. I know. I already finished mine yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff, man. So what do, you, what do you think in terms of the taste? It is... Holy mint, yeah, on yeah. on the palate. It's got that ninety five five beautiful spicy minty palate on it. Then that secondary finish from the oak is is restrained, which which is good. I I like that it's coming through kind of that smoky that charry, but it's restrained. It's not completely like uh, like a Woodford double double where they know that they're giving you oak. And you know that you're getting. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. It's yeah, out yeah. of balance for a reason, right? Like this, this is good. You you balanced it well. It's restrained, but it's definitely there. And I I absolutely love the ninety five five rise that come through with that big minty, sweet honey and the, like the peppery finish, nice and oily. And it's like a a touch of like a creamy nougat on yeah. the way down too. It just it, it hits everything for me. It, it's like it's right where it needs to be. So this is the best. The, you think this one is your best of the FKOs, in your opinion? We think this is the best yeah, batch. Nice. This one we're drinking right now. Uh, we felt like this was the best batch. It's delicious. I have no doubt, Matt. I agree, man. It's just the the rye comes through. I mean, you can still tell it's a rye. You still tell it's a ninety five five rye. But the uh, you know you just get that that secondary finish that really adds that extra that extra little something to it. The smokiness. Um, not, and, you know, even a little sweetness to it to me. Um, mm-hmm. and it's not, it's, it's not like you said, Matt, and not that there's anything wrong. Cause I love Woodford double oaked and double, double oaked, uh, in the old Forester 1910. I love those products. Um, but you know, they're geared, you know, what you're, you know, you know, the, what you're going for out of balance, completely out of balance. This is not something that I would say is out of balance, you know, even though it's a secondary finish with a barrel. Um, it's it's still a very well balanced rye whiskey in my opinion. So, thank you. Yeah, we we go for balance. Yeah, you know, we we mm-hmm. we've experienced the over oak notes, the big oak notes, and there's nothing sure. wrong with that because sometimes, you know, like if if you're drinking like, let's say Lagavulin, right? Yeah. You're looking for a punch of peat in the face, or even like almost our hundred proof, you know, seventy six rye, like a ninety five percent rye or a pure rye. You're looking for a punch of rye, right? So some whiskeys are intentionally sort of off balance in a sure. certain way. And that's great. Other times you're looking for balance, and we we look for balance here. Um, and yeah, I think you guys, you know, yeah, that was a pretty good description. Yeah, I think I, I I agree completely. The balance on this is it's great. Um, so gosh, we're at the end of round three already, which is crazy because um, we could keep talking for a while. <laughs> yeah, easily, easily. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. So let's talk. I mean, you kind of alluded to the future things going on. Anything else though, in terms of the future of the distillery and the brand that that's coming up or things you want to talk about that you haven't already touched on? Sure. So we, we actually just added some new fermenters. So we just doubled our production capacity at the distillery. Great. So we're, we're happy with the whiskey we've been making and we're going to make more. Nice. Uh, We just finished basically building uh, our first Rick house out in uh, Midway. You know? uh, yeah, I was going to ask you guys, I mean, are you, are your barrels on site downtown right now or do no. you? Okay. So we okay. produce too many. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. You know, barrel warehouses, especially newly constructed ones, uh, versus ones that are grandfathered in, yeah, uh, are really complicated to build. Much more harder than the actual distillery, because essentially a barrel full of whiskey is a little bomb in terms of uh, <laughs> right. in terms of you know any government or licensing body. So imagine having thousands and thousands sure. of them, yeah. in a densely populated we got, urban we got neighborhood. Thirty-five thousand bombs, just <laughs> yeah. Sitting, yeah, that's the way people look at it. So you know, from licensing and, and code stuff. So um, we just couldn't to do it in the city. We we wanted to, but it was just very sure. problematic. Um, so we're 20 minutes down the road okay. uh, and we just finished that. So we're going to be able to consolidate. We've been working with other warehouses to age our whiskeys. Okay. Uh, so we keep bringing everything under one roof, you know, giving mm-hmm. us more control over every step of the process. And so, uh, that'll be great for us to do. Nice. Very nice. So things are looking great, man. I mean, you got, you got great products. I mean, I'm very, very happy that that bourbon. Yeah, man, that's, that's right on <laughs> for sure. Uh, the single malt too. I mean, and again, I'm not a single malt drinker, but I really enjoy that. Matt, I could tell you obviously, yeah, definitely enjoyed that one, man. Right. Kind of blown away. Shocked, yeah. shocked really. Yeah. I wasn't well, expecting, expecting that. 
Yeah. The winner of the night for me is probably that rye. Uh, and I'm a bourbon guy, but I, I'm mad. I'm sure that probably is the yeah. winner for you too. Well, FKO, please. <laughs> yeah, man. No, no, no doubt about it. So Amir, where can people find information about, about old pepper and, uh, James pepper distilling? Jamesypepper.com. It's going to have a lot of information yeah. for you. Um, and, uh, that would probably be the go-to. Uh, okay. So go there, check it out. Any questions, anybody's always welcome. You can send us an email from the website. We're pretty quick. Okay. Uh, and then obviously come, come see us at the distillery. We're yeah. right downtown Lexington. We're in the distillery district. Uh, you know, we're, we're right next in between ethereal and Goodfellas. Yeah. Um, man. A lot of people, slice. <laughs> yeah. You know, people, a lot of people walk by and they don't even know mm -hmm. we're back there, but you know, you come through our gift shop and retail shop and then I don't think people really understand the size and what we got going on behind in the distillery. Yeah. Uh, so we really love when people come take tours, check us out. Um, you know, people have a really good time. Um, so we'd love to see everybody there as well. Yeah. So you guys are open for the public, yes. open for tours, everything now. Sure. So now that the state is finally after two years, <laughs> we're finally opening things back up to everybody. Right. So that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, Matt, anything you want to add before we wrap it up, close it out? Amir, thanks for taking the time to sit back with us and, and chat and everything. I was legitimately on the edge of my seat he was. listening to I'm this gonna, story. I'm, seriously, I'm going to say, because Matt, I, I joked earlier, right, about Matt. He leans back in his chair. He grabs his mic. He kind of sits back. And I looked over during round two, and Matt is like up on the edge of his seat, on the <laughs> edge of the table, right up on his microphone, just watching you and listening to you. And I was like, wow, Matt is like, I mean, honestly, like completely enthralled. So, oh, great story, but also a great storyteller. You can yeah, have, there you go. You know, a, a great story, but if you can't convey it well, yeah, what's the point? Thank so, you. Yeah, well, thank you. Dude, your attention to detail and your passion for not only what you've put in your bottle, but the story behind it and the why. Yeah. And the, the quality and everything really shows through. And we appreciate that. I know that your consumers certainly do. And I hope that everybody takes the chance to come here to Lexington. We finally have some hometown heroes on the show and yeah. gets to visit yeah. you. Yeah. Definitely, because we just had Sam and and Ben from yeah. Mi from uh, I want to say Midway, but from Bluegrass. Yep, uh, about a month ago, right? So yeah, so we're getting the Lexington guys on this show now, yeah, man, absolutely. which is awesome. So we love it. Let's keep doing it. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it's so great. You know, I, it's such a pleasure for me to be here with you guys. Um, I'm so happy that you're here in Lexington. Thanks, uh, man. And I'm so happy that you know I could come and no one has tasted any of our bourbon distillates you guys are the first people we've ever shared this with uh, seriously yeah oh, seriously wow. all right man uh, in any kind of media capacity or anything okay and well thank me, you this is like the start of something great because now we can start like this is the beginning this is I, i've been saying for four years to everyone in my business like 2022 that's it 2022 <laughs> like that's a year and so wow. i really enjoy being here with you guys and um i think we're gonna have a lot of fun things that we can try and drink and talk about and, and do in the future and so it was really my pleasure i appreciate you guys awesome. inviting me to be on the show and taking the time to, yeah, man. to hear the story yeah we we enjoyed it man because i'm a i'm a history minor uh from college <laughs> so i'm a poli sci guy but history minor so i'm i love history um so especially kentucky history so that's that's awesome to get to hear um the history of a great brand and a person that was obviously very instrumental to the development and advancement of, of bourbon here in, in the state. So that's really cool. Uh, looking forward already to round two at some point <laughs> in the, in the near future, man, and coming down to visit you guys down at the distillery. Same so, here. Maybe we do the next one live from the distillery. I think that would be great, man. I'm all about we'll that. We'll loop in Aaron and the team. We'll, yeah. we'll have a good time. These, well, perfect. These microphones, the board, everything travels, man. We pack it up and we're good to go, <laughs> man. So we can, we can make it happen. Right, Matt? Mm-hmm. All Absolutely. Right. Great. Well, Amir, we appreciate you being here with us tonight, man. Enjoyed everything. And I think once we finish, I'm probably going to have another sip of that uh, FKO. <laughs> I think I'm going to join you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. But uh, before we wrap it up, I just want to thank everybody. Thank all of our sponsors. We appreciate everything that, that they do for us. Uh, we appreciate you, our listeners, of course. Um, you can always reach out to us, please. Uh, TheBourbonLife at gmail.com. Send us an email. Tell us what you want to hear. If there's a guest you'd like to talk to, or like for us to talk to, let us know. We'd be happy to, to work that out. Also, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook. We've got our private Facebook group, The Bourbon Lifers. Please feel free to join that. If you feel so inclined, leave us a review on Apple, iTunes, podcasts, whatever platform you listen to. We'd appreciate that as well. And with that said, man, I'm going to wrap it up, send us home with our tagline, which is, may your glasses always be full and may you keep on living The Bourbon Life. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of The Bourbon Life Podcast. Our mission at The Bourbon Life is simple, to share our passion for all things bourbon with you every week. And we
we'd really love to hear your thoughts on how we're doing. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Bourbon Life. You can also contact us by email at thebourbonlife at gmail.com. And you can always find us on your favorite podcast platform. If you have a moment, we'd love it if you would rate us and give us a review. So until next week, we hope your glass is always full and that you keep on living the bourbon life. Founded by J.W. McCulloch in 1885, Green River was known as the Whiskey Without Regrets. But after a gradual decline of the distillery over the years, the brand had all but disappeared. But in 2020, Green River celebrated the revival of Green River Distilling Company at its original home in Owensboro, Kentucky, led by 8th generation distiller and Kentuckian Jacob Call. And now, after a century of waiting, Green River is proud to announce the return of their flagship Green River Straight Bourbon Whiskey to shelves around the country. We encourage you to find out more about this new bourbon, aged for more than five years, at www.greenriverwhiskey.com. Whether it's rye, sour mash Tennessee whiskey, or bourbon, Davidson Reserve has something delicious to offer any whiskey lover's palate. Pick up a bottle of one of our award-winning Davidson Reserve whiskeys from your local retailer today. Visit www.davidsonreserve.com for more information, and cheers to drinking local.